Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. Yeah. All right, let's get going. I'm done talking about football. NWA World Championship Wrestling from May 7th, 1988. So the show opens with a... I told you last week. Yeah, it's not so much a recap, but they re-air part of Paul, uh, Paul Bosch's promo. From like a month ago. Yeah. When Dusty Rhodes was suspended, and he said it was unfair, and the punishment did not fit the crime. And they go to the studio where there's the announcers, Jim Ross, David Crockett, and Tony Schiavone. And they say, we have big news. And they turn to David, because it's his brother's promotion, so he's the one who gets to make the announcement. And he says, the board of directors has changed their minds. <laughs> That's his exact quote. That's so much funnier today than it was back then. <laughs> the board of directors has changed their minds. Dusty Rhodes has been reinstated. Yes. And there's a dramatic pause, and no one in the crowd reacts one bit. And there were a couple boos. There may have been even a couple boos. Yeah. And then they clarify, he can wrestle at any time. And then there's a, oh, oh yay, yay. <laughs> See, I saw it differently. I, I saw him say, Dusty has been reinstated. He can wrestle anywhere. Long pause. Like he forgot what was next. And then finally he goes, but he is no longer the U.S. champion. It was very awkward. Yes. Well, it's David Crockett. Well, it's David Crockett. He's never it, not been awkward. Fa- fans were not ready. Fans were still into this Midnight Rider angle. They didn't necessarily want us to just come back. Well, the reality is, Vinny, they weren't that into the angle. Hmm. That's why they ended it. Well, there's that, too. <laughs> I mean, they, they cheered the Rider. But, I mean, financially... From a ticket buying perspective, not the it didn't fire. make a shit's worth of difference. Right. And probably did worse. So Cornette comes out, he's appalled at this Dusty Rose decision, but he has more important things to worry about. His own announcement where the U.S. tag titles are returned to his men. And then he introduces the Midnight Express to compete against Jerry Price and Dark Star. He actually started out by saying, as of today, the Midnight Express are the U.S. tag team champions. Not they're going to be. Mm-hmm. Like, he was so insistent that I actually had to Google it. Yes. And find out, when did they win the titles back? Mm-hmm. Then they do the match, and he explains that, in fact, well, they're about to become the champions. They're about to be, be uh... Yes. The reinstatement has not you. actually happened. Yes. The, the decision of the title match will be reversed, and the belt will be returned to their rightful owners, his men. Yeah. So, what did this Dark Star do? Was it Dark Star or Jerry Price? I'm assuming Dark Star is the one who had stars on his tights. Uh, yes. But... Whichever one did not have stars in his tights, which I think was Jerry Price, they beat the fuck out of him. Yeah. They beat him and beat him. Cornette had a line about how he'd been wrestling for like 10 minutes, so maybe they'll just beat up the new guy because we can day. Give him a big hip toss on the floor, the cement studio floor. He just goes splat. They beat the hell out of him. Finally, they let Dark Star tag in and quickly pin him with a rocket launcher. I don't know who is who. I don't either. I'm guessing. Like I say, I'm guessing... The guy with the star in his tights was Dark Star. Mm-hmm. Well, the star was white, so it wasn't that dark. Well, there was one guy that was white and one guy that was black. Is that two? And what? I don't know. Dark Star. I don't know if he was the white guy. Maybe he was. I don't know. Are you sure they were not both black guys? I sat here and watched. Honest the to God, I don't remember. I, okay, I'm pretty sure they're both black guys. Okay. Well. Anyway. So I wasn't Cornette, paying that close of attention. Cornette got a promo here. I just saw that one guy got beaten up for like 10 minutes, and I wondered what he did wrong. That's exact that beating. That part you were correct on. Yeah, he just got massacred. Yeah. So Cornette gets a promo. He vows they're going to get rid of everyone, the Fantastics and Dusty, whoever, whoever else is in their way. They're going to get their belts back today, and they're going to prove they can throw the biggest party in all of wrestling. And Stan Lee throws his hands in the air and shouts, Hallelujah! Stanley, okay, so I can't say he never talks. Like, once every ten shows, he cuts a quick promo mm-hmm. and is in and out. He, just, he normally, him and Eaton just stand there. Yes. They stand there, they look into the audience, they wink at girls, they fuck around, not do anything. They don't pay attention to a thing Cornette's saying. And then, as soon as Cornette mentions a party, Stan Lane came to life. <laughs> he chanted hallelujah. <laughs> Later, he starts screaming, Party! He's all excited for this party that's coming up here tonight. And why wouldn't you be? He was he was getting ready. And the best part is, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, okay? I have to. I have to spoil what's going on later. We may as well just talk about the best thing on the show now. Best thing I've ever seen. Jim Cornette's promised that there's going to be a party tonight. And Stan Lane 
is excited for a party, okay? It's the 80s. It's Stan Lane, okay? <laughs> when I think of a Stan Lane party in the 80s, <laughs> I think of a lot of different things. Most of which you can't show on cable television. A lot of debauchery. Yes. A lot of God only knows what. Questionable legal activity. He's so excited that I can only imagine what's coming at this party. So, later, Corn and the Midnight's come out for the party. The party. There is a fucking table with a cake on it. Uh-huh. The Midnight's are wearing party hats. Yeah, they- they're they're Cone. blowing on the gimmicks, yeah, yeah, and I'm not talking about like those kind of gimmicks. I'm no. talking you blow and it goes zzz, and comes back out. Exactly. And they're throwing confetti up in the air. Mm-hmm. They all have Paisley had a more debaucherous <laughs> second birthday party than these fucking guys were throwing right here. The best part is not only is it is it totally innocent and ridiculous for these grown men to be doing this, it's also super super cheap. Yes, Corner is very clear. He had his mom made the cake. There are. Exactly three plates with three forks and three knives and three cans of Coca-Cola. Because he wouldn't spring for champagne, although he put under the guise of, I don't approve of my men consuming alcoholic beverages. Exactly, sure. But yes, it's a great party. We'll get to the party in a minute. I said to talk about the party. Talk about Stan's there. excitement for the party. Yes. Sting versus Bob Emery. Ross? I have never seen a wrestler as shredded and muscular as Sting. Who has pulled his tights up so far? <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? Like, usually people pull their tights up because they got love handles. Yes. So they're trying to pull them above the love handles because then, like, above your love handles, it's a little thinner or up below your ribs. Yes, yes. So they hike their, their, their trunks up or their tights or whatever. He's got them fucking hiked up so high. Yeah. He has no love handles. No. He's shredded. Why did he pull his tights up so high? I would have to go back and check. It's between him and Shawn Michaels for who wore the highest Yeah, pants. but Shawn was nowhere near as shredded as Sting was. All right. That's I fair. was baffled. So the only thing I note in this match is that in the early announcement when they said Dusty Rhodes was reinstated, they added that he was not going to be have the U.S. title returned to him. That, that stripping is per- permanent. And Ross said he will have to compete in the tournament with everyone else. Here he corrected himself. Dusty is still going to be the special guest of Paul Bosch, while the Midnight Rider is in the tournament. I see. A very key spot, I'm sure. Man, Ross, he's got to be careful with what he's saying. Sting promo after his win. Scorpion. They're pushing he's in a collision course with Flair. Yep. If he can ever get that Scorpion on, he'll surely be the champion. Of course, of course. So he talks about how the Midnight Express were out there threatening to throw a party. He wasn't invited, but he'd crashed parties before. He might just crash theirs. Sadly, he did not. In hindsight, he would have made the whole thing even better. But then he says that somebody else has been partying. Maybe, he says, partying a little too hard. Even harder than I like to party, if you know what I mean. I don't know what he means, but I can guess. He's, he's implying someone had been making decisions under the influence of heavy narcotics. Uh, yeah, It's the worst. He's talking about Barry Windham. Still can't believe Barry has turned his back on a good man like Lex Luger and joined the Four Horsemen. There's a part of him that still wants to give Barry a second chance. Yeah, he says, I think Barry needs a second chance. The fans boo him. And so he, he has to explain himself, which it's actually a fairly logical point. He says, how can a guy be so good for so long and then do something like that? Fair question. I don't have an answer. And then he concludes with the following line. Okay, this is to Barry Windham. He says, and I quote, get it straight, Barry. That's all I've got to say. He walks away. <laughs> he made his point. Get it straight. This Barry's traveling a crooked path. All right, it's time for the party. Yes. So we talked about the party hats, the three cans of Coke, Coca-Cola. I need to clarify. Uh, the plastic silverware, just enough for three people. Stan asks about the women. So there's supposed to be women here. Cornette says, well, they're having car trouble, but that means they'll be half price. <laughs> wow. Later, Stan asked about the band. Cornette said there's a guy warming up with an accordion backstage. <laughs> I'm assuming this is all completely bullshitted. And they just fed off each other perfectly. Tomorrow was apparently the next Maybe day. Maybe Jackson parody. Might be. You hadn't thought of that, had you? I had not. Uh, the day after this was uh, apparently based on this promo, both Mother's Day and the Kentucky Derby. And he wished a happy Mother's Day to his mom and also said she had three horses running in the Kentucky Derby. Wow. Which is impressive. Is that fair? 
Well, cover, it's just like uh, Paul Jones having two men in the croc or two teams in the Crockett Cup. Mm-hmm. Cover your well, bases. he's a heel. So my question remains: Is that fair? To so run is Mama Cornette. I don't know how it works. I don't know about horse racing. Yeah. Like if you're if you're playing baseball and you have money, I mean, can you throw four balls? I guess that would help the other guy. Never mind. Go ahead. So stands there. You got to picture this. Can you have a thick bat? Stan's <laughs> Stan's a grown man, right? Now he's got he's I'm not got sure. he's got his wrestling gear on, which is already ridiculous enough. He's got the party hat with a string tucked under his chin. He is complaining there's no champagne because he needs to have a serious party with champagne for his celebration. Finally, Cornet he Cornet goes on for a while about all this. He's gonna get the belts back. It's time for the announcement. They're gonna celebrate it's their anniversary. He makes it clear we're having fun. Nobody else is invited. Not, yeah, not the fans. No. Not uh, Jim Ross was doing the interview. Now, maybe David and Jim Crockett, because they still have the power to return the belts. Sure, he, yeah. He sucked up to them, made it very clear he voted for Jim Crockett to be reelected to the chairman of the board of directors. Although he does note repeatedly, it's a secret ballot. Yeah. So his, his claim cannot be verified. He has to make sure you know he's full of shit. Yes, yes. So David Crockett arrives, which disappoints Cornette. He wants Jim Crockett there to bring the belts to him. And David... Eventually, breaks the news. The board has decided not to return the belts. Corner has a conniption fit. He can't believe this insanity. David walks away. The Midnights follow him. At which point, you'll never guess. The Fantastics zoom in, and they push Cornet's face into the cake. Yes. And they run away. Cornet comes up That's screaming. That's the best part. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is like... How to explain this? So, no matter how tough you are, if you're the toughest man in the world, if you fuck around with someone not so tough to a certain degree, they'll get so mad that you're going to run. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. That's what the Fantastics did. Like, realistically, shoving the guy's face in the cake and then fleeing sounds like a, like a heel move or like they're cowards. You know what I mean? But the thing was, they slammed this guy's deal into the cake. And even though they have beaten the Midnight Express, they're the better men. They wrestled them for 40 minutes and were victorious, okay? They're the winners. They're better. When they slammed that guy's head into the cake and ruined his day in the party, the moment that Midnight Express showed up, they ran for their lives. Well, you got to look at it this way. They had already won. They had. They had nothing else to fight they for. They were just getting out of it. <laughs> we made this guy look like a fool. I loved it. Our mission's accomplished. We have nothing to gain by they fighting They ran him. for their lives. Now, just to make sure, just to make sure that the Midnight's did, come out, look, did not come out of this looking uh, like a, a, a feared unit or something to be uh, to chase the Fantastics away, they both were very, very careful to slip and slide all over that cake. Yes. And go crashing on their asses on the floor just to make sure you knew that they were the buffoons, not the Fantastics. Now, through all of this, through the chasing and the returning and the slipping and the sliding, Stan Lane never lost his party hat or his sunglasses. It's because he's a professional. He's the man. Yeah. This is the best thing I ever saw in my whole life. I don't know if I'd go that far, but it was definitely the best thing on this show. It was the best thing on this show. It was the best thing on this show in a long time. This is awesome. And by the way, I guarantee you that if this angle would have taken place on Raw... The heels would have been rewarded the titles back. They would have been reinstated. <laughs> and then had their party. And that would have been the end. They would have been reinstated. They would have put the baby faces face in the cake. Yes. And beaten the shit out of them. That's exactly right. And left right. them laying. That is exactly right. Yes. And it would have sucked. Al Perez versus Gary Royal. I've never been so happy to see Al Perez. I needed a break after the last segment. I was not uh, ready to come down from that high. Well, fuck, this brought me down from that high. <laughs> it sure did. A boring fucking match. All I, all I got out of this match is, he's doing this match, they're talking about Oregon, Yep, they're plugging a match tonight at the Portland Sports Arena, Buddy may have been on that show for all I know. Good good chance. And Al hits his spinning toe hold and he really cranks it, and he really twists that knee, gets a submission, and Jim Ross says, man, that's so deep, it's almost a figure four. <laughs> Which begs the question, why doesn't he do the figure four? You know what I'm saying? It's Flair's move. I know that, but it's like... He does a spinning toe hold. As a, as a, if I were a sports fan watching this thinking it's a sporting event, mm-hmm. I'd be wondering why doesn't he do the figure four? Why does he stop halfway? 
I don't know. Maybe the toehold focuses on a different part of the, the knee. The point is, sometimes you can be too good an analyst. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, them saying hi to Don Owen was the highlight of the match. So, Gary Hart does a promo. The U.S. title tournament's coming up in Houston, and he says, No Texas fan would ever cheer for Nikita Kulov over his Latin heartthrob, Al Perez. And Al promises that even though the suspension has been lifted, he is going to beat the Midnight Rider and tear his mask off anyway just for fun. Gary Hart says, I want all you Latins to show up in Houston. <laughs> Support the Latin heartthrob. Did you go, Brian? And then adds, don't let us down. <laughs> I, I know you go. were 12 or whatever. Yes, but did uh, not go. Yeah. Powers of Pain versus Curtis Thompson and Rick Paradise. Rick Paradise. I think he's been on before, but what a name. So this barbarian's my favorite wrestler. He's awesome. Like, if you if you really watch him do stuff, he incorrectly executes 50% of the moves that he does. But he's so fucking strong that it doesn't matter. Exactly. Like, he does the power slam, but he doesn't, like, hook the guy right. Just, he just still turns just him over and him smashes over. him right the way they're supposed to go down. The Warlord is a big, strong, powerful, bodybuilding-looking dude. It looks like he's pretending to be a pro wrestler. A little bit. Barbarian looks like he'd kill you. Yes. Exactly. That, you're exactly right about that. They beat the crap out of these two dudes, especially Thompson, who actually got whipped, uh, thrown outside, and Ivan whipped him with a chain. Yes. That's very painful. And the power is won with the rocker plex and the heart attack. Paul Jones says, you cannot deny the power of pain. <laughs> Everything's funny when Paul Jones says it. It is. He did the heart that? attack. Warlord actually played the role of Bret Hart. He did. He hit the ropes. He ran. He hit the clothesline. It was actually the fastest I've ever seen him move in my life. Mm -hmm. And then Jim Ross explains that he displayed great flexibility. Mm. <laughs> the flexibility to run upright. To jump. <laughs> but you know, it's funny. This is a true story. Jim Ross mentioned that the Warlord had great flexibility running. Okay. The human body is designed to run. Right. It takes no added flexibility. In a straight line, yes, okay. yeah. Now, I make fun of that line, but I remember when I was... It was the very first house show that I ever went to in my life. I can't remember. I think it was, it was 88 or 89. It was at the Seattle Center Coliseum. And I think it was Warlord versus Coco Beware, some goofy match. That sounds atrocious. Okay. So anyway, Warlord, at some point in the match, was knocked to the mat. He's flat on his back. Please okay. tell me he couldn't get up. <laughs> no. But he's flat on his back, and his arms only go this far. They wouldn't actually touch the mat flat. I see. Because his chest was so tight that his arms only went to here. Okay? <laughs> so, in fact, it did take great flexibility for him to run in well, a straight line upright. I've mentioned this. The warlord we've seen the past two or three months in the show is no great shakes. But he's better. He's way better than I remember him being. Did he get much worse in his time? I, I think if you watched his stuff... Uh, he's, he's, nah. No. He never was that bad, or? Yeah, I don't think he was as bad as you imagine. Okay, that's... He was always as bad as he is right now. Okay. Which is fairly bad, Vinny. Oh, it's certainly not good. He's not good. Not good. He's better than Jerry only. Yes. Yes. So they go to do a promo after the break. Now, Warlord, we were just talking about him. He was working very hard in there. He was throwing men around, grown men flying through the sky. He was running, as you noted, to hit a heart attack. But it wasn't that long. And there was a commercial break, and they came back, and he's exhausted. Now, the, the gimmick is only Ivan and uh, Paul Jones are the talking. So Barbarian and Warlord are just standing up front looking mean or occasionally flexing or slapping each other or whatever. Warlord is trying so hard to keep his mouth closed and breathe through his nose, but it is a struggle. He is huffing and puffing. He's had a long day. They're both standing there. Paul Jones gets talking. Warlord and Barbarian are standing up front. Mugging at the camera, and Barbarian goes, because they're number one. <laughs> then Warlord looks over to me, he's gasping, and he goes, holds up his one finger. He agrees. So Paul starts ranting. He's ranting about guts! And uh, he rants like you do, he bangs the table he the does. whole time I may be talking. subconsciously imitating Paul Jones. Yes. Yeah. And so he starts ranting, but he's not banging the table. So Barbarian, he starts banging the table. <laughs> so, so fun. So then... Paul's writing about guts. He says, I want to spell guts with a capital G. 
Because where are the road warriors today? It's like, what the fuck does that have to do with capitalizing anything? What are you talking about? <laughs> that's what made it so great. He says they finally met their match. They don't have the guts to be in the same building with the powers of pain. <laughs> powers of pain, he says, is number one. Not are, oh, is. Is. Powers of pain is number one. Mm-hmm. Barbarian's mugging for the camera. Ivan Koloff starts ranting and raving. Now Barbarian's clearly bored. <laughs> Warlord's still attempting to get his breath back again. Ivan says the powers of pain are known not only for the scientific wrestling. Yes. But also, as we saw today, their compassion. <laughs> yes. So Paul Jones starts ranting again. Says, I surrounded myself with the best guys. And I'm wealthy enough to get the job done. Okay. That's his conclusion. (laughs) And then Barbarian goes, ah! (laughs) And Warlord looks at him, and he flexes, and they're out of here. This is the best gang ever. Incredible. I I, want to go back over this last line, because I I think this is what he said. He says, people say that I'm great. He did definitely say that. Well, I'm great enough to surround myself with powerful people and wealthy enough to get the job done. So does that mean he's not really that great? He's just wealthy and powerful? Yeah, you know, kind of a little bit. Am I overthinking this? Yeah, probably. Dude, it's Paul Jones. <laughs> You're overthinking anything that he ever says. Steve Williams versus Keith Steinborn. Doc pinned him quickly with the stampede. Yeah. Then he cuts a promo, a promo about how every day you wake up in the morning, you put on your robe and slippers, you head out to the mailbox, you check your mail, and you hold it for one special envelope. Y'all know what I mean. But I'm assuming that means his pay. I'm assuming it means his payday, yeah. yeah. I didn't know what he meant. He didn't do a very good job explaining this. He didn't have direct deposit. No. But lately he says there's been no envelope. Not what? Get, I guess he's not getting paid. Man. So he calls it the four there. horsemen. Jim Crockett promotions. All four of them, and especially Ric Flair. He knows, what t- he knows what it takes to be world champion, he says. Talking about his UWF title reign, which just vanished, finally. And he promised every man in this business is going to feel the stampede. Mm. Kevin Sullivan versus Robbie Amon. Been a long time since I really buried a jobber. We got two coming up. Robbie Amon, I swear, I swear to God, I know I exaggerate sometimes. I've never seen a skinnier, more gangly man with gyno in my entire life. How? <laughs> I don't know what to How tell did you. he go this wrong? <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Dude. So Sullivan beat the holy hell out of him and then punched him in the face. Yes. And pinned him. That's what happened. He's Ronnie Garvin now. J.J. Dillon promo. <laughs> I love his take on this. He understands why the board of directors has made this bad decision about Dusty. It's because ever since the four horsemen signed Barry Windham, they've changed the entire complexion of the business. They've thrown everything off kilter. And now Dusty has to be reinstated to unify everyone so he, J.J. Dillon, won't be so hard to deal with. He promises the suspension is off the table. Dusty's been reinstated. He's free to wrestle. So unmasking the Midnight Rider won't do anything to get Dusty out of wrestling for a year. But he's still going to unmask the Midnight Rider just to embarrass Dusty Rhodes. And at the same time, he's going to concentrate on Tully Blanchard and Barry Windham, who are both in this tournament. Much like Mama Cornette and her three horses. Mm. Barry Windham versus Larry Davis. Davis is our favorite whipping boy over the past month or so. He's He's been up there. He's absolutely horrible, absolutely hideous. So Barry's new gimmick is he's always had the lariat and the superplex horse finishers, but now before the match, he puts on the black glove, and he has the dreaded claw hold at his disposal. So he beats this guy up, hits the most violent lariat of his career. Like he was legit trying to break this guy's neck. He wins the match, and then J.J. says, no, no, put him in the claw. And Wyndham puts him in the claw after the match just to be a dick. And then he cuts a promo. Which is good, by the way, because he just turned, mm-hmm. and he came out, and when they announced Barry Wyndham coming up next, they hear women cheering. Well, yeah. He came out, and he, he really was not that over as a heel. No. So he needed to do something to try to get the people not like him. Unfortunately, he's putting the claw on Larry Davis. Didn't really work. <laughs> Gives a shit. I'd have clawed the guy. What do you think of his promo, though? His promo, his promos are so much better as a heel. Yes, like a thousand times better. By the way, I just, I just, I did love in JJ's promo. 
he's so angry about this whole Dusty Rhodes thing, okay? Like, he wanted to unmask the guy and make sure he was suspended for a year. Mm -hmm. This has all been ruined. Man's been reinstated. But, as long as he can prove that he was right, yes, he will be satisfied. <laughs> That's it. Like, it's all over for him. He cannot get this man suspended for a year. But he is still obsessed with taking the mask off the Midnight Rider. It means nothing, except he will prove that he was right. Yeah. What a great heel. Fantastic. Yes. So, when we cut to this promo... Great promo. He's at the top of his career. Now that he's with the Four Horsemen, he's going to make more money. He's going to have more cars. He's going to have more women. He's going to have more fun than ever before. And he's well, gonna... he said, Ric Flair promised me I'll have more fun than ever before. Ric Flair promised him. I was Which, like, damn straight. I was going to say. <laughs> You're right about that, buddy. I don't doubt that I don't know about the rest of this, but that I can guarantee. So he's says, I'm going to win that U.S. title. I'm going to leave Dusty Rhodes crying over spilt milk. He, I thought he was just awesome here. Like, one of the best he promos was. on the show. Awesome. Yeah. He was great. Yes. The Fantastics versus Joe Strickland and Tony Bowen. I believe Tony... Oh, no. Joe Strickland. I believe is well, the here, fat tub of goo in this match. It was beyond happened. atrocious. Here's what happened. The Fantastics started with a promo where they go join... I guess it was Ross, whoever it was. But they uh, say thank you to the board of directors for letting us keep the U.S. tag titles. Thank you to all the fans for the cards and letters you sent in encouraging them to make the right decision and standing up for us. So as I started to cut this promo, the show's almost over. We've been watching for a while. I, I kind of zoned out during the promo and started dicking around with whatever. So the match was like two minutes. And I look up at the end, and there's the Fantastics, the U.S. Tag Team Champions, beating up a fat guy in his underwear. Okay. Hold on, Vinny. I have to say something here. Okay. God rest the soul of Buddy Wayne. But he was wrong. Okay. Many people have been wrong about this. You ever heard You ever heard these guys they want to get into wrestling? They want to become wrestlers. They want to make it their career. And you say, "Well, go to Lance Storm's school. Go to Buddy Wayne's school. Go to this school, go to that school." And they say, "Well, before I go to wrestling school, I want to get in shape first." Mm -hmm. All right. Buddy Countless other people, including myself at times, have always said, just start. <laughs> if you if you if you if you're if you decide you must get in shape first, you're never gonna start. Just start, okay? Wrong. If you look like this fucking guy here, Joe Strickland, and get or in fucking shape. Joe Strickland and or Tony Bowen before you get in this fucking ring. He was disgusting. He was foul to look at. Oh, fuck! This. He was 100% body fat. <laughs> just, just. I don't know if he had bones. <laughs> he was all fat straight through. They went and out. And he sucked. They went to the closest bowling At least alley. Dusty was good. They went to the closest bowling alley. They picked the fattest guy. They took Do his shirt off. Do not insult bowlers this way, Vinny. <laughs> Threw him in the ring. God. He was just I was so pissed off when I saw this. Like, have a, just like a, have a smidgen of self respect. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's Not a, everybody's going to have abs, mm -hmm. okay? Not everyone's going to be below 25% body fat, okay? But you're going out on national television pretending to be a grappler. An athlete. A world championship level grappler. Have a smidgen of self-respect. If you're going to buy boots like this man did. Yes. If you're going to buy trunks like this man did. I'll get back to those in a minute. Buy a singlet. <laughs> they make them for fat guys. I don't even... I was probably the fattest guy in this show. But we've seen lots of fat wrestlers. They wear singlets. Fine. Yeah. Cover we, yourself up. It's good to have different body wear sizes. A shirt. But yes. Now, if you are going to buy trunks and wrestle bare-chested on national television... Shave. That too. Shave please. And, shave and tan. <laughs> but don't get trunks that are black in the back and then white in the front. Oh. <laughs> it's just... He just looked like a fat guy in underwear on national TV. Because he was, Vinny. But <laughs> You're not acting even, like I, he was something else. No, but... You're acting like he was Mr. America. I but he I, looked like a fat guy. I need to... to we often say, make the joke about how we, we spend all this time talking about guys in their underwear pretending to fight. This looked like underwear. Like Hanes. 
Like yeah. Fruit of the Loom. Yeah. It was disgusting. I didn't like it. They pinned him with a rocket launcher. Now, I didn't see didn't even notice until the very end. Like They punched him and pinned him. That's all I saw. I kind of want to go back and watch this and verify just how fat and horrible he was. He, I was is, so, he is very... I was so distracted by his fatness, I don't think I appreciated the depth of his horribleness. I need to go back and double check. Kevin, Kevin Sullivan cuts a promo. He says everything he says is the truth. He said Dusty Rhodes would beat Lex Luger for the U.S. title. That was the truth. He said Barry Windham would make a name for himself with a horseman. That was the truth. And the truth is, everything he says about Patty is the truth. Now, I believe before, he said that when Jimmy Garvin left home and hit the loop and hit the towns, that was when Sullivan was spending time with Patty. Now he's reversed his story. Mm. Now he says when he left, when he was doing towns, that was when Jimmy was making time with his woman. So he calls her Patty over and over again. He promises the most devious plan in the history of the wrestling industry. The Dungeon of Doom. I guess. That's all I can think of. And that was pretty damn devious. It's a long con. Yes. I'm so mad at Jimmy Garvin and Precious that I will make a horrible stable in a, in a decade. <laughs> yeah. Well, six years. Not that long. I guess, yeah. Ivan Koloff versus David Isley. This David Isley fella. <laughs> so, what happened here? This match is like five minutes long. It's just it's Ivan beating him and beating him. There's nothing going on. It's not horrible, but it's certainly not exciting. It's the end of the show. And out of nowhere, they do a spot where Ivan will whip David in. David will jump up to the middle rope of the corner. He'll come off with a reverse crossbody, but Ivan will duck. And David will land on the mat, and then Ivan will pin him. So David gets whipped in, and he jumps up to that middle rope. And he turns, and he jumps, and Ivan ducks. But David does not jump high or far enough. And as he comes down, his knees come down across Ivan's body, which, if you understand anything about leverage... If his body's coming down like this... Or gravity. Or gravity. His knees stop. His face continues. Oh. He landed right in his face. I laughed, and 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 I laughed. You know who didn't laugh? Ivan Koloff. Ivan gets up with this disgusted look on his face. He kicks the guy right in the ribs. <laughs> he hits his finish. He gets the pin. Then he leaps in the air and just double stomps him right in the guts. <laughs> Cut to punish him. That'll teach him. That was the end of the show. Yeah, they announced that next week they will... Excellent show this week. ...reveal to us the new NWA United States Champion. Yes. That's being decided before we watch the show again. So we'll find out next week on the show. You, the listener, will find out next week Mm -hmm. who the new NWA United States Champion is. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. So, NWA World Championship Wrestling, May 14th, 1988... Open with the clip from last week of Jim Cornette going face first into the cake. In all, as much detail as we tried to cram into that review and how every single facet of it is awesome, I completely missed Cornette going face first into the cake. And then as the Midnight's Flea, he does not just rise up, but he scoops cake into his face. <laughs> yeah. Just to make sure as he much as possible. He is a professional. He is. Yes. That cannot be denied. Whatever you want to say about Jim Cornette, he's a professional. Absolutely. So this is not from the studio. No. This is from... They were live, and it was awesome. They're from Leon County Civic Center in Tallahassee, Florida. These fans were out of their minds for this For show. everything. They loved everything. They should have never left this building. Well, I can't say they loved everything, because we had boring chance in at least two of these matches. But for the most part, they loved all the baby faces. You're right. They hated all the heels. I will, I will amend my comment. What they loved, they loved passionately. Yeah. yeah. So Nikita comes out for a promo. They love Nikita. They were drowning out his promo with chance of his name. Now, even if we there were no fans, I don't I don't think I would have understood much here. All I all I know is I'm watching Nikita rant and rave, and he's ranting about Alvarez. That's just baffled. <laughs> he's just mumbling along and he's mumbling and every now and then I hear Alvarez and he's mumbling and I hear Alvarez. I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? Then I figure out he's talking about Al Perez. Al Perez. But he calls him Al Perez. <laughs> yeah. That's actually much more entertaining than anything, I, than anything I got out of this. I'll tell you another thing I got out of this is important. He's talking about the Four Horsemen. This dastardly... I guess they're now four again. For yeah. a while, there were only three. Mm-hmm. He's ranting and raving about them, and basically he's saying that I don't care about you guys. 
I'll fight any of you. Because he says, all of the friends I have on my side. I thought, how quaint. Baby face that has a bunch of friends. Mm -hmm. He's not just a loner. No. He's not just out there getting his ass kicked and no one comes out to save him. There's a dastardly group of heels, but you know what? There is a valiant group of baby faces. Mm -hmm. and it was all, it was Isn't this like every fucking movie, too? Repeatedly on the show. Is there like ever a movie where it's like all heels and there's like a one baby face and he has no friends? Like Rambo. Zero friends. <laughs> Once in a while. Rambo has friends, they're just all killed. I see. <laughs> you know what I mean? These fucking guys on Raw have no friends. That's true. That's true. Not even... I gotta... I, Finn fucking Balor, okay? Finn Balor on last week's show... I don't know if you heard, Vinny. George H.W. Bush died, mm -hmm. and they're in Texas. And Vince shows up Monday afternoon and he rewrites the show. Because George Bush died. Okay. And he's sure these fans will be sad. They need some happy endings. <laughs> Forget the fucking wrestling fans that watch this fucking show every week, and it's all heat. It's got to, because of George H.W. Bush, he's got to write a happier show. So, Finn Balor comes out, and Finn Balor, throughout the show, does run-ins to save baby faces. Okay. So, like, you know, Elias is getting beat down, here comes Finn Balor. Apollo Crews is getting beaten down, here comes Finn Balor. Just comes and saves random baby faces. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then at the very end of the fucking show, he gets beat up by Drew McIntyre. Do you know how many baby faces saved Finn Balor? I'm going to guess zero. zero. <laughs> Where the fuck was Elias? Where are all the other baby faces he saved? They're nowhere. <laughs> so, st I hate this show. It's so hard to do, Brian. It's not hard to do. So That's what makes me so mad. If it were hard to do, I wouldn't be so mad. You know what I'm saying? My child's potty training. It's hard for her. There you go, Ken. Yeah, she wore a diaper her How whole are we, life. Three minutes into the show, all she's known in her life, Vinny, is wearing a diaper. Then one day, her crazy fucking parents take the diaper off. They have her run around naked, and they want her to pee in a bucket. Okay, it's fucking bizarre for a child. All right, that's hard for a baby. So you're like, okay, well, you know, she peed all over the floor, but you know, this is hard. You're not mad about it, okay? Mm -hmm. If you're if you start fucking peeing on the chair right there, I'm yeah. gonna be fucking pissed off. Too late. You should know better. That's why I get mad at Raw. Because know better. it shouldn't be this hard. Raw should know better than to peel over the floor. Exactly. They should know better than to be so shitty. Where were we? Fantastics versus Robbie Allman and Jerry Price. My God, the jobbers on the show. You know who this is, Vinny? Robbie Allman. This was the same shitty fucker from last week. That was the skinniest guy that I ever saw with Gyno. That's right over here. Yeah. That's the same guy. Yes. He was the same guy that fucked up with Kevin Sullivan, and Kevin Sullivan beat the shit out of him. Mm -hmm. Well, he got brought back this week to a different town. Can you fucking imagine? They, they, they like, transported him somewhere. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? And he gets in there, and he fucks everything up. How do you he... fuck up a side backbreaker? With the Fantastics. Jesus. <laughs> he fucked up everything. When they did a monkey flip and he flipped through the air and landed on his ass, oh, I could have watched that all day. He's terrible. It, it, it needs to be repeated. How can a guy this, this skinny have gyno? Well, I've seen a lot of fat guys a with bad gyno. bad cycle? I know myself, but God. So, he's horrible to look at. He's worse to watch wrestle. They beat him up forever and finally they pin him with a rocket launcher. I confidently declared Robbie Allman to be the worst wrestler of all time of the week. Little did I know. Hey. You know what, though? The fans love the Fantastics. They went nuts for them. So, yeah, more power to them. They cut a great promo. They thanked the fans for motivating them to win those U.S. Tag Team titles. Said, yeah, they put Jim Cornette in a the cake. They still want to strap his ass. And they, Excuse me? That's what they sort of we're gonna pull down your pants and strap your hind end or something. Heiny. Wow. Yeah. And they also made a joke about his mom running in the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, she's <laughs> That's not nice. It's very, very rude. That's not nice. Did you understand anything that Paul Lering had to say in his promo? Like, uh, not really. Not no. like he was mumbling. He was speaking clearly. But Dude, it was not just Paul Ellering. Like, Ric Flair, the Horseman. At least there Flair. were so many. No, no, don't even defend Flair. I love Flair. Mm -hmm. He had fucking nothing to say. But at least he had mentioned the names of other people in the wrestling promotion. Yeah, but it was all generic stuff. Like, we're yeah. going to beat people up all summer. Yeah, I, okay. Whoopty fucking do. It was not newsworthy. But no. I got his point. 
Ellering cuts this promo about stocks and rotten eggs and life being a long shootout at the OK Corral. I don't know. What the fuck? He's a he's a wise man, Vinny. He was talking above your level. Apparently. Your brain is only so big. I guess so. Steve Williams versus Gary Phelps. This fucking Gary Phelps. <laughs> First. And you know what? We've seen him a hundred times. <laughs> this other guy, this Robbie Allman, like he's new. <laughs> he's a new shithead. All right. This Gary Phelps we've seen a thousand times. I've never seen him look remotely this bad. No. He's never looked good. <laughs> But, like, this was a new level of bad. The first 10 seconds of this is both the best and worst 10 seconds of all time. Doc grabs him. Doc whips him in. Doc goes to give him a shoulder tackle. Yes. And Phelps, like, sidesteps him. He, he runs around him. <laughs> and runs around him. What did he think the spot was? <laughs> and you know he, what I mean? And so Doc is left standing there with his shoulder out. And he stops and looks. And... <laughs> Steve Williams, the scariest wrestler on the entire roster, gives Phelps the stare of death. Like, yes. You fucked up my shoulder tackle. Yeah. And Phelps realizes he's pissed off Dr. Death and just goes, <laughs> like, like, he's apologizing. I fucked that up. I know I fucked that up. Please don't kill me. But you know what? I thought Doc was going to kill this guy. In fact, he was overly polite. He just worked with him. He worked with him, and he pinned him, and everyone cheered. He, they pushed him as a future champion, and we moved on with our lives. He took this guy. Okay. Oh, Here's a question, Benny. Right. How do you fuck this up? I have no idea. Okay, I understand, like, I've seen many times where, like, you, you do the headlock, you shoot the guy off, and you say tackle, and for some reason, both guys decide they're going to take a bump off the tackle. Sure. Okay, you fucked up, but... Something, you both heard tackle. I don't know why the guy calling, I guess, yeah, the guy, anyway, the point of this is, he ran around the tackle. It was, it was, he wasn't calling a spot, he was warning the man. It's like, it's like Dr. Death goes, watch the tackle, and he's watching and he gets out of the way. That's not what that means. No. How do you just run around the guy? He's lucky he's alive right now. Yes, assuming he is. So, well, he wasn't killed in the match, is my point. Yeah. So, at this point, I declared I was wrong. Gary Phelps is the worst wrestler of all time of the week. For real. I still think the other guy was worse, to be honest. They were both very, very terrible. Yes. Now for something not terrible. Ron Garvin and Gorgeous Jimmy versus the Varsity Club. Dude, you watch this match, and you listen to these people, and you ask yourself... How did Ron Garvin not work as the world champion? Yeah. He was, like, so over here. <laughs> and the heels, they work him over, and he's a babyface in peril, and they're just going crazy, just going nuts for this guy. He does a drop-down spot with Rotundo and just punches him right in the face. It's the best, because that's his finish. Yeah. If, if any other guy had thrown this punch, it would have been just a hope spot. But in the middle of the heat, he, like... You know, Rotunda charges and Garvin drops down and he pops up and hits the knockout punch of death. And they're both down and everyone's going crazy. And that wasn't even a hot tag. It was, no. It was just a, a, a very big host spot, but just a host spot. Yes. So even before that, the first part of this, it's all back and forth wrestling. It's not like the varsity club went in there and bumped around like fools for 10 minutes. They were... They were 40-60, I would say. But the key is after every exchange, the Garvins will come out on top. Often with a great big punch. So, if the Garvins were selling, it was for a very brief time. If a varsity club was selling, they would sell for a bit, but then escape. So, it was two even teams is my point. They finally cut off Ronnie. They do the knockout punch spot we talked about. Ricky Rick Steiner puts him in a camel clutch. And Ronnie, from his knees, is got his arms hooked over Steiner's legs. And he's lifting him up and planting him, and he's dragging Steiner in the camel clutch to the corner to try to tag out. And at the last second, Steiner just lets go and punches Jimmy off the apron. The other thing about this is the whole time Kevin Sullivan's in the corner, he's not watching the match at all. Kevin Sullivan only has eyes for Patty. He's just staring at her. His expression is blank. His eyes are wide open. He is just staring at her the entire time. What a time. creep. He's a very creepy man. This match, besides just being awesome storytelling, these guys are working their asses off. These were four athletes in there. And finally, Jimmy gets the hot tag. 
and he's running wild, and uh, Rotunda and Steiner try to double-team him, so Ronnie jumps in, and it's a four-way, and that is Kevin Sullivan's opening. And as soon as it's a four-way, he charges in a lap around the ring. He grabs Patty. He throws over his shoulder, and he runs to the back as fast as he can. He was not fucking around. No, he knew he would, now was his chance. Now was his chance. And he was right. And he was right. This this hot tag, by the way, by Jimmy Garvin, like, you watch his hot tag, and you understand why people loved pro wrestling. Yeah! He's just running wild. These fans are going crazy. They love every second of it. And in the middle of it, this man, Kevin Sullivan, steals Jimmy Garvin's wife. Now, he steals her. The place is just going batshit. The announcers who are at ringside. Yes. They're looking up at the ring. They explain to us, it's so loud in here, Jimmy can't hear a scream that his wife has just been kidnapped. Yeah. And you know how he finds out she's gone? He makes a big comeback. The heels clear the ring. He goes over. He gives the big high five to his brother. And then, of course, he turns to be acknowledged by his wife. Which, Where's Precious? Where'd she go? And Jim Ross is screaming, Sullivan's got her! And he rushes to the back. Jimmy. And you know what? I gotta say something about him rushing to the back. He starts rushing to the back to save his wife. Mm-hmm. This has been built up for a long time. He rushes to save his wife, and the fans begin to boo. <laughs> you want to know why? Because in a vacuum, this was awesome. But this is not a vacuum. This fucking company has done one fuck finish after another. And these people were fucking sick of it. It didn't matter if, like, the storyline was paying off. It didn't matter if it was logical. It didn't matter if the babyface was going to save his wife, who got kidnapped by Ganon. What the fuck was the name of that Super Mario bad guy? Ganon was in Legend of Zelda, I think. Okay, whatever. Anyway. Of Bowser. Bowser captured this woman nobody gave a shit they were mad another fuck finish in a match we were watching he does kind of look like a bowser yeah <laughs> think about it so anyway they didn't so, like that no they did not like it but i i i don't care this match was awesome it was awesome this is everything that would make you a pro wrestling fan right but this was why they were being sold yes so ronnie and jimmy run backstage they can't find her they're knocking on well, they're opening doors trying to find her shouting her name and they find her there's a, they open the, the, the door, and there's a dressing room, and it's dark. And they hit the lights, and Precious is hiding under the counter and weeping. Mm, not good. And when Jimmy goes to console her, she screams, Get your hands off me, Jimmy Garvin! She screams, Leave me alone! She's crying, she's sobbing, she's hysterical, but she's mad at Jimmy. And finally, they can't, they can't reason with her, and they shut the door on the camera. There's trouble in the Garvin household. Weird. Weird and creepy. That's what the announcers say. This is weird. I thought this whole segment was, from the match and the post-match angle was just completely out of this world awesome. It was awesome. I don't know I don't know where it goes. I have absolutely no memory of the finale of this feud here, but, you know, you had Jimmy Garvin and his wife there, and they just do the same thing for years. Mm-hmm. And And finally, we got something different. And it is definitely weird. She's telling her squeeze... Yeah. Jimmy Garvin to get out of here mm-hmm. after she got kidnapped by the devil. Intrigue. Intrigued. Al Perez versus Russ Mosley. A third contender for the worst wrestler of all time of the week. I'm honestly not sure whose fault the first one was. But they're outside, and Al says, I'm going to press this man over my head and throw him back into the ring. And he presses Russ up. And he goes to throw him, like, I think he wanted to throw him over the second rope, but he didn't get nearly high enough. And so Russ tried to duck his head, and as a result, he went back of the neck first into the middle rope. Ugh. And then in one motion, he went into the ring and straight down and landed on his head again. Okay, you know whose fault this was, Vinny? Probably Russ's. This was the fault of Al Perez. All right. You know why? Because, as we'll find out later in the show, the only smart guy in this entire roster is Sting. Sting went in there with Larry Davis. I'm going to spoil it. There ain't much to talk about. He had the Stinger Splash, put him in the Scorpion Death Lock, and won. Okay? All Larry Davis had to do was stand there and lay there. That's it. That's it. All these other shitheads on this show are trying all of this crazy shit with these horrible guys. Why? Why are they trying to do spots with these jobbers? <laughs> I don't know. I, I fucking don't get it. <laughs> Why would you do that? 
The Midnight Express does it, like, I guess just to become better or something. I don't even know why. Or just to amuse themselves. But, like, I don't know. Fucking Dr. Death trying spots with Gary Phelps. The Fantastics trying spots with Robbie Allman. Al Perez spying, trying spots with Russ Mosley. Who the fuck is that? I don't know. I'd never heard of him before. I don't know if we'll ever see him again after this. Boring chance in this match. There were some. I like when Al went to do a slingshot. The guy just fell down on his face. Instead of landing on his feet and jumping on the turnbuckle in one motion, Russ just lands on his feet and face plants. Yeah, he just goes up and down. It was awesome. If you say so. In its own way. I you're hated this match. <laughs> I hated everyone working with these jobbers. You know what? I, I don't was, blame you. I was sick of it. I don't blame you. It, it, it sickened me as a worker. But it led to this Gary Hart promo. This was a great promo. This was unbelievable. Gary starts talking about Nikita Koloff. Everyone says Nikita has defected from Russia. He's all about the USA now. As far as I'm concerned, Nikita's a Bald-headed socialist pig. Yes. Now, let's stop right there. Well, he's not bald-headed. But Gary is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what's awesome. Gary Hart making fun of another man for being bald is awesome, especially when the guy is not bald anymore. Yeah. That is funny. That is funny. He talks about the liberal, ridiculous Americans who cheer for Nikita. I believe he said they are some kind of demonic moron. Well, yeah, he said, this is this is my country. Nikita is nothing but a communist pig. Yes. And he finally says, if you're believing the hogwash about Nikita, you're a fool. You're a fool! Yeah. Somewhere in here, Al Perez also talked, but who cares? Yeah, who cares about Al Gary Perez? Gary was great. It's terrible. Disgusted his name rhymes with Alvarez. <laughs> Dusty Rhodes promo. I'll never forgive him for that. So remember we watched that Dusty Flair special, and that one woman called Dusty a hunk? I was going to make fun of Al Perez saying, his last name is Perez, why is his first name Al? I realize my last name is Alvarez, my first name is Brian. I have, I have nothing, I have nothing I can say. Al could be short for Alejandro. It could be. Yeah. Brian is not short for anything Mexican. So on Thursday, whenever it was, we watched that Dusty Flair special, and there's the woman who calls Dusty Rhodes a hunk, mm -hmm. and we laughed at her. Joke's on us. She was not in the minority. These women love Dusty Rhodes. Well, his first name is Al. Oh, there you go. But it doesn't say Alejandro. Mm -hmm. So they are screaming for Dusty. He comes out and says he's happy to be back in Florida, where he says, I'm not making this up, you've got Christians? you got good-looking ladies? you got good-looking men? And you got rednecks. And I love rednecks. Yeah. I was just I was just baffled because Dusty's there talking about his friendship with Lex Luger, which still just seems so bizarre. They would not have much in common. No, it's just weird. So he runs down the horseman and everything, and he says, Tully Blanchard's hide and hind end belongs to me. He says, there's a war going on. I'm a general in this war, and I love you. He was out of his mind here, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, he's crazy. Sting versus Larry Davis. I had to go back and check and make sure Larry Davis and Gary Phelps are not the same person. They're definitely different guys. Yeah. Sting wins with the Scorpion in seconds. And also, besides Sting not fucking around, this is also what they did with Magnum TA when the plan was to make him world champion. Yeah. They'd have him win in seconds. Sting's a much better promo than Magnum TA. They're different. <laughs> they certainly are. <laughs> Magnum was a pretty goddamn good promo. He won bad. Sting is just a crazy man. I, 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 which I guess fits with whatever his gimmick is. Sting captivates me way more than Magnum ever did. I don't even know what his character is. He's just, I thought he was a surfer, then he buried surfers last week. He's just Sting. He likes to party, but he still thinks Barry went and parties too hard. He says, when I used to get out of control, I'd stand on my head to get more blood flow to my brain. Yeah. So Barry needs to stand on his head. I mean, in theory, that would work. That's his point. I'm not sure what it does. It gets blood in your brain. It straightens to do you out. what? It straightens you out. Oh, yeah? <laughs> That's what he said. Okay, when we get fucked up next Sunday for the Christmas show, mm -hmm. I'm going to make you stand on your head afterwards. We'll see if you get straightened out. See what I can do. Yeah. I got. Hey, I got guys here. You will be on your head. Hmm. You do have... Yeah. 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 So, let's see. Yeah, he, he challenges a horseman, and he notes, I have multiple friends mm -hmm. who will back me up. And list them. Yeah. There's like a dozen people he's friends with. It's crazy. 
This had been a great show up to this point. Oh, fuck. This was such an awesome show. And there's no one for the 1980s who can kill a good show faster than Ricky Santana. Well, half the jobbers on this show. No, they they, they don't kill it. They're, it's fun to watch them flop around like untrained fools and die. I guess that's die. true. This was Ricky Santana boring. does nothing to entertain anyone. Fans chanted boring. And he's in there with Mike Jackson. Who's awesome. Mike Jackson was the star of this match. Santana's just trying to kill the match by just arm dragging him and holding him down for hours Jeez. on end. We watch, now granted most of them in the studio and it's a different kind of fan base, but they do these live shows, I don't know, every couple months. You never hear boring chants. Well, because it's rarely boring. <laughs> but this was fucking boring. Ricky Santana made this so fucking boring. It goes on and on. It's also, by the way, babyface versus babyface. Yeah. It's still chanting boring. He's fucking got him. These goddamn hammer locks. It goes forever. He wins with a top rope splash and gets heartily booed. No, that's also because Jim Cornette was coming out. But still. So... Cornette's there to cut a promo. They show the party footage again. Yeah. Okay. I love the party footage. It is hilarious. It ain't that good. You know what I mean? It's key here. The key here is when he comes out, he's stable. And they tell him, well, yes, we're going to show this footage again. Yes. Then he goes nuts. How yes. dare you show it a third time? Yes. So the, the pr- I believe they showed this footage more than when Shawn Michaels went through the barber shop window. Probably. And I think I saw that 35 times in yeah. the course of about two weeks. So now his dander is up. I guess Marty went through the window. Marty went through the window. Yeah. Cornette's dander is up. He says, we've already whipped the Fantastics. We humiliated you in front of the world. I know that pain won't last forever. The pain will go away, but the shame will always tarnish your soul. He promises they won't get their hands on him, and they damn sure won't whip him. Had the flare promo. Yeah. As noted, he had nothing to say. Big time beatings all summer long, he says. We're the best this sport has to offer. I have a question for the girls. What's causing all this? Yeah. That's his promo. So he and Barry and the horsemen were going to get all the women, and at that point they cut to a woman in the crowd who was wearing a very tight white top and no bra. Uh, well, that's true. That is true. Arn Anderson versus Ryan Wagner. Arn started the match with a DDT. Yeah, I thought <laughs> it was over. Also not fucking around. No. Another he, smart guy. He did some stuff for... Two minutes, and then he he had a gourd buster of complete death for the win. Yes. I mean, it's a face-first bump. If you're taking this, you can land on your knees and, and one hand. The other arm's over his head, but you can protect yourself. Ryan Wagner landed on his forehead. This man is a professional. I guess so. He was determined to make it look good. And then the horseman cut a promo. Another one. There was nothing to say here. Just In a fact, random. JJ says anyone can come and try and kick our butt. He did say butt about eight times. Tully... Tully says promo about we made Luger what he is today. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Directionless promo. Arn repeated his promo from last week. Yep, Arn just cuts. It's just like, what's going on here? Yeah. How dare you get jealous about Barry Windham for achieving the American dream? Barry Windham versus Keith Steinborn. Barry wins immediately with a lariat. Puts him in the claw after the match just to be a dick. And then Barry cut a hell of a promo. This actually was a very good promo. And he said the word ass. He did. Which got bleeped. He's asked, why did you put the claw on afterwards? And he just goes crazy. Everybody's jealous. Luger's jealous. Dusty's jealous. I'm 6'6". Six, six. He said, I never had to go to the gym. I grew up 6'6". Six six. I'm all natural. Yeah. I came out of the womb 6'6". Six, six. Yeah. I don't think he did. So diamonds are forever and so are the four horsemen. He's a horseman because he wants to. Yeah. And he'll be one as long as he wants to be one. The Road Warriors versus the Powers of Pain. All right. I know you're going to bury this match of any, but I'm a fair man. Right. There was a spot in here that was completely fucked up. There sure was. <laughs> it was a barbarian. I mean, can you imagine that barbarian and animal fucked a spot up? When you hear those names, mm-hmm. you don't think smooth grappling. <laughs> don't. So it's barbarian and animal. And I'm Before gonna... you start, I just want to say I have no idea what they were even trying. Okay. So go ahead. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt because they were supposed to do something while Ivan Koloff took the referee, yeah. okay? So they get in a headlock position or whatever, and they start to go to the ropes, and they realize that whatever they're going to do, they're facing the wrong way. Mm-hmm. So they go to a different set of ropes, and then I presume that whatever they were going to do involved 
like a tackle and then move off one direction. At which point they realized, well, now we're really going the wrong direction. So anyway, they were lost. They were. They could not figure out where do we go to do the spot and not get in the way of Ivan. So they basically run around each other like satellites. Mm -hmm. And then they just start over again. Eventually, nothing. With that said, Vinny, yeah. okay, outside of that, for a match involving the road warriors and the powers of pain in a street fight, this actually was like a pretty fucking good match, I thought. There was a lot of club... Well, okay, yeah, I'll, I will talk about this one spot first, because you described it in greater detail than I could, because I was not sure what was going on. All I know is they tried something. I even took the ref. They tried something. Whatever it was was clearly not what actually happened, and they, like, separate... An animal just says, fuck! And then shortly after that, Barbarian just kicked him and he flew over the top rope. Yes. It's like, just kick me. Yeah. <laughs> just kick me, I'll go over. Other than that, Brian, yes, you were correct. It was, they were a bunch of big, strong men doing a bunch of clubber and forearms. Hawks doing a drop kick here or there. Barbarian doing a power slam. I, again, there were no wrist locks in this. No. There no, there was but no, you know what? Let me say something I'm about... Not, that's not a knock. No, I'm not saying that at all. There's yeah. something totally different about it. Yeah. So... How many times have we seen, we're going to see one this coming weekend, TLC. It's a TLC pay-per-view coming up. we got to put some fucking people in a TLC match. Do they need to be in a TLC match? No. Mm. Is there any storyline reason that Asuka, Becky, and Charlotte should be in a three-way TLC match? No. Nope. No. Okay. But it's TLC time. Just like every year in October, it's Hell in a Cell time. Right. And we're going to do some fucking Cell matches, whether it makes sense or not. All right? This was the Road Warriors versus the Powers of Pain, and they booked it as a street fight. Why? Because there's no way they're going to have a good match. <laughs> they're not going to exchange holds. Mm -hmm. It would have been fucking terrible as a straight match. So they looked at the participants, and they realized, you know what would be a good match? How could we, make, how could we have a good match with these four guys? Let's make it a street fight. And thus, they booked a street fight, and you know what? It was a very, very good match. That's what wrestling is all about. Like... It's fake. You could do whatever the fuck you want. Right? Yeah. So, why is it so hard? Don't ask guys to do what they're no, bad at. No, don't make people do things just for the sake of it. Yeah. So, as I was saying with my no wrist locks comment, it's good that every match doesn't look the same. I don't need to see two hours of a show where every match is just like this tag match. But in a match where it's mostly squashes, mostly squashes, or squatches. One great tag this match. This was for squatches. <laughs> this actually was for squatches. So, once in a show is very good. Yeah. Not to mention, like, do you remember that first Braun Strowman Brock Lesnar match? I remember Vince the first had him one. go out and exchange fucking holds, and it was fucking terrible. Yeah. That's a match that should have been a street fight. Yes. Or a TLC match. Or something. Not a wrestling match. They should not have grappled. So, Hawk gets a hot tag. Everyone's going crazy. And then Ivan hits the ring for the DQ. At the same time, the horsemen attack Animal on the floor. Uh, the big spot is they lay Hawk on a chair, and Barbarian hits a, to hits a top rope splash. Five on one beating. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. The powers of pain. The yeah, the powers of pain. Ivan and Tully and Arn. Yeah, five. And yeah. they took Arn away, and yeah, or took uh, Animal out of the picture. Anyway, yeah, they, lay, they laid out Hawk, and as they go to commercial, and you know we see the timer. We know there's five minutes or less left. Yeah. They say, still to come, folks, the ball rope match. God, when they said that, I was like, you know what's going to happen. I don't know. I, this is the first time we've seen it on this particular episode, or this this particular television program. But Jim Crockett Promotions, their, whatever their syndicated show was, was notorious for plugging a main event for an entire hour, starting the match with two minutes to go, and then saying, oh, fans, we got to go. Yeah. A complete ripoff. And they did it every week. This is the first time they've done it here. It's Dusty Rhodes versus Tully Blanchard in the bull rope match. Tully jumps him before the bell. While he while Dusty is tethered to the rope, but Tully is not. And they beat him for a couple minutes. But then as soon as Tully puts the bull rope on, Dusty makes a comeback. And then we got to go. Why bother? Like, all you're doing is making fans upset. They did it all the like, time. Like, was there one fan that was happy that he got a two-minute bull rope match after it had been promoted the entire show? There was zero fans happy about that. So all you did was you purposely made people upset. Yeah. They troll their own fans. <laughs> it's like Raw. Yes. So there you go. That's uh, that's that. You're going to be mine all night 
I enjoyed it. It was fine. But. NWA World Championship Wrestling, May 21st, 1988. Open with a recap of Kevin Sullivan kidnapping Precious last week. Yeah, so what happened? Well, we learned nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> last week, they had a great cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. Kevin Sullivan kidnaps Precious. Yes. Precious's husband, Jimmy Garvin, rushes backstage. Mm-hmm. He finds her cowering in the locker room and screaming at him, her husband, to get away from her. Yeah. Okay. So, like, I went about my week. (laughs) I've been wondering, what happened to Precious? What happened with Precious and Kevin Sullivan? Well, we come back here and the answer is nothing. An hour later, you're still wondering. We should have mentioned this was a one-hour show. Yes. I assume baseball was on or something. Arn Anderson versus David Isley. Arn looked great. But this went way too long. Finally, Arn won with a gourd buster. Nothing to write home about. The only thing of note here, which we can segue into something else, Jim Ross said that Arn Anderson is 100 proof. Hmm. Sounds like the Christmas show. Today is December 23rd. That means tomorrow, Monday, the Christmas show will be released. It will be unleashed <laughs> upon the world at approximately... Approximately everybody, give or take, three Pacific, six Eastern. There you go. That's when the Christmas show will be released tomorrow. You can you can hear it as part of your subscription to WrestlingObserver.com, or if you'd like to subscribe to Video.F4WOnline.com, mm-hmm. you can see the video version. The video includes everyone wearing wacky hats. Yeah, we all have wacky hats on. We we drink a lot. <laughs> Tony was not impressed by the wacky hats. We yell at each other. Producer Rob is drinking and producing. I can only imagine what that leads to. I do remember... Considering it has quality of work when he's sober. Before I got too drunk, I do remember you had to tell him to switch the camera to you because you were talking and it was on somebody else. <laughs> that sounds slightly familiar. Yes. <laughs> That's ringing a bell. Yes. This is going to be an all-time, this will be an all-time classic Christmas show, I believe. <laughs> One way or another. Yeah. And by the way, if you subscribe to video.f4wonline.com, you can watch this show, too, and all the Brian and Vinny shows. Yeah. And the whole archives are there for subscribers. You can go back and watch last year's Christmas show. Sure. Like, do not miss out on this, everybody. You will not regret it. I regret it. <laughs> I'm going to play some here. Go ahead. <laughs> Four Horsemen cut a promo, or three of them did. So, two weeks ago, they promised that we would find out uh, by the next show who the U.S. champion was. One week ago, we did not find out who the U.S. champion was. Now, Barry is just out there with a belt. I presume he won the tournament. Never went in any detail. He's the U.S. champion now. So, it is Wyndham and Art Anderson and Tully Blanchard against Dusty Rhodes and Sting and Lex Luger in the Omni. In the Omni. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Yeah. Though no one can see, unless you're at the Omni. So among... <laughs> you're really hung up on this, aren't you? I really am, actually. After an hour of this, I was like, it's fine to like promote the house show, uh-huh. you know, promote the main event, that sort of thing. You built an entire national television show around a show we can't see that's the next night in Atlanta. There were one or two casual mentions of the bashes. Yeah. And one or two this casual mentions of a show in right? Houston in June. Yes. Okay, so it's well over a month away. Yes. But yes, the, the vast majority of this was devoted to plugging a show at the Omni the next night that would not be televised at all. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Dylan's great line here was where he claimed Lex Luger is the next coming of the American dream. Mm. He's following in Dusty Rhodes' footsteps. Yes. Do they have anything in common? Well, they're male. Blonde. Oh, so yes, Wyndham is the U.S. champion now. He says, this belt proves I am worthy of the Four Horsemen. And then Tully, Tully goes, and Tully's on fire. The bastards are coming, he says, but before then, I've got Dusty Rhodes and barbed wire in Houston on June 10th. He points to the scars in his forehead, says, I'm not afraid of scars. I'm not doing commercials. I wrestle for a living. He says, I've wanted Dusty Rhodes gone for a long time. J.J. Dillon's wanted Dusty Rhodes gone for a long time. Ric Flair's wanted Dusty Rhodes gone for a long time. Arn Anderson has wanted Dusty Rhodes gone for a long time. And now Barry Windham wants Dusty Rhodes gone too, and I'm the man to do it. This was great. All right, here's your preview for the show tomorrow. What happened What happened to the couch upstairs? He... 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 Uncle... Uncle... Trumbled. Um, 
Did you go? Yes, baby. That's what happened. Uncle Tom That's barfed on your couch. Yes. That's what happened, she says. Yeah. Isn't that better than Vinny is a goober? Yes. Uncle Tom barfed on your That's couch. That's much better. Yes. Vinny is a goober. Mike Rotunda versus Trent Knight. So the first 30 seconds of this, they were on just completely different pages. They couldn't do a damn thing. Nothing was going right. And finally, Rotunda just says, fuck this. And he grabs him and he does the biggest, highest, greatest shoot, shoot hip toss of all time. Now, Knight helped. So it wasn't really a shoot hip toss. But I trust me, Rotunda was hurting this guy. And he was going over whether he, he, whether he helped or not. That was awesome. Nothing else happened. Rick Steiner and Kevin Sullivan interfered a lot. It was mostly half-assed interference. Can you imagine? Yeah. Half-assed interference to beat Trent Knight. There was a point, and it's actually relevant, it comes up later in the show, but Rotunda's got like a chin lock on, and he puts his feet on the bottom ropes just because. And Steiner just walks over and puts his hand on Rotunda's feet. Not like he's trying to keep them on the ropes or add levers, it's like he's just trying to keep them warm or something. He's just putting, putting them there to rest his hands. Rotunda eventually wins with a double arm suplex. Varsity Club promo. Kevin Sullivan doing his usual gimmick. I knew Patty before Jimmy Garvin. Mm -hmm. If you want to know the truth, get Patty out here and let her tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how Patty reacts to me tomorrow in the Omni. (laughs) Then he starts talking about a Tower of Doom. He promises to build the Tower of Doom and Patty will come home. Yes, it's what you're thinking of. So he started talking about a match we're going to see in 1996. It's one of the worst matches of all time. No, a different, different tower. Different tower. Of Did doom. they have a tower of doom before the triple decker? This is the triple decker. I guess. No. Wait, I got to check this out now. When was the first tower of doom match? I thought it was well, 90. So, there was actually someone world class. Uh, but they, they did a tower of doom. It was the, uh, the same cage. Yeah, that, that, that Paige and Jarrett had and David Arquette. The same cage. Different match. That, that's different than what we're thinking here. I'm thinking the Tower of Doom that was a triple-decker cage match. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. No, nah, because the one that Arkad and everybody used was different. Okay. It was like a... I'll check Three it Three cages here. on top of each other? Yeah, something like weird, triple yeah. Triple-decker? Are you thinking of the Doomsday cage match? Yeah, the, the, the Doomsday cage match of Doom or whatever. The Alliance to End Hulkamania match? Yes! This is not that. Okay, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, this is not that. Okay. Thank God. Now, what they finally do... Spoiler. I just thought... I was just hoping he was working on a cage for eight years. <laughs> It's good to have goals. <laughs> yeah. A hobby. That'd be a hell of a storyline. <laughs> Eight, Eight year years build. ago, I started talking about the Tower of Doom, <laughs> and now, cage. in 1996, here it is. Yes. He also said last week when Jimmy was out flying his airplane, and Patty said, I'll stay home, I've got things to do, I was the one, or I was the thing she had to do, is what he said. That's pretty racy. Awfully lewd. Sting versus versus Max MacGyver from an arena somewhere. Sting won in 30 seconds. And boy, it's clear. When they this company has a next big thing in mind, they don't mess around with him. Magnum, go out there and squash this guy in 30 seconds. Magnum got hurt. Nikita, go squash this guy in 30 seconds. Nikita's time is done. Sting, go squash that guy in 30 seconds. So Sting's doing this interview afterwards. And they try to bring a young Sting fan into the ring. It's not even so much that they're the next big thing. It was just like the theory was... Like, if you want to see Sting have long matches, you got to pay. That, too. You got to see Sting do his long matches on TV. That, too. You got to see someone boring the fuck out of you on TV. Sure. Exciting guys you got to pay to go see. <laughs> sure. So there's a young boy with a face paint like Sting and a haircut like Sting, and they try to bring him into the ring, and this child absolutely wants no part of going into this wrestling ring. He's screaming. Hey, at least he got to ringside. Screaming and crying and shaking his head no. And Sting does the best job ever of covering this up. He just says, that kid's got the right face paint on. He's even got the right haircut. And he asks all the little kids, come to the bashes. Make sure you're dressed up like me. And a lot of them did. Yeah. Barry Windham versus Ryan Wagner. Just nothing happened to these damn squash matches Wagner this week. Wagner was not very good. He did weighted Windham a lot. And it didn't matter because Windham was deceptively strong. He just muscled this guy around, one with a lariat. So JJ cuts a promo. Oh, this was great. Yes, it was. First off, they still have that preposterous horseman logo. Yes. Every time I see it, I laugh. They've, They've got lost the fanfare. Yeah, the trumpets are gone. Yes. So JJ says, Barry Windham is a tremendous athlete. It's only been the last few weeks that Barry has rid himself of the guilt trips yes. and everything else. Yes. I thought he knew Granny. He said, I finally appreciate what a great athlete that 
Lex Luger is. The women are salivating over Barry Windham. Mm. Actually, they were salivating. They actually were. They, 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 were, they were women. They were literally salivating. Yes. I feel like... I feel like Gorilla Monsoon, but it's true. Yes. Like, stuff was coming out of their mouths. They were salivating at Barry Windham. Don't look at me like that, Tony. Said he carried the banner of the horseman like a man and a true horseman. And this belt proves that he's the best. Promos are so much better as a heel. A million times better. He warned Lex, you have never faced Barry Windham in this mode before. I'm going to lead the horseman on a crusade against Dusty. I'm going to teach Lex a wrestling lesson, and I am the man Dusty Rhodes always wanted to be. Al Perez versus Keith Steinborn. You don't got to pay to see Al Perez. We'll give you him for free. <laughs> the only two things worth noting in this match are, at one point, Keith's leaning on the ropes, and Gary Hart goes to interfere, and <laughs> he... Grabs him with his right hand. He raises his left fist high in the air, and he brings it down like this. Now, it's not a hammer fist. His head's not here. His head's here. So he punches him to the side of the head like that. It was not a very good punch is what I'm saying. Sounds like Sid's punches. Actually, we're very close. Sid used to do that same thing. He put his hand like this, and he would, he would like, do that. Yeah, at least that's a sideway, like, like a, a like swipe. A, like, a, like a fly swatter. Yeah. This is a straight down, like a, like a hammer fist to the shoulder is what it was like. And then Al, uh, did, he grabbed him for a pile driver, and then instead of suplexed him backwards over, I have now seen two wrestlers ever in my life do this move. Al Perez here, and Lawrence Taylor to Bam Bam Bigelow at WrestleMania. That's it. Al won with the spinning toe hold. Yeah, this flying forearm. Tito, Tito Santana had a great flying forearm. Mm-hmm. Al Perez had a shitty flying forearm. He does. And they showed a replay in slow motion of it. It didn't help. It's like... I'm sure there's got to be something else in this match that he did. Did he do anything cool? Show me a slow motion shot of. Dusty Rhodes promo. Tons of people booing. Mm. Got a hell of a tan, though. Hair is just out of control. Yeah. He just woken up. It's entirely likely. Says he taught Barry better than this. Some people could get to the line but couldn't jump over it. He promised Lex is going to hurt Barry. Hmm. Tully Blanchard versus Dave Spearman. Best thing in this match. Dave Spearman is tossed outside. Tully takes the ref. J.J. Dillon walks up to Dave Spearman, and as Spearman gets to his feet, J.J. turns away and crosses his arms. <laughs> few seconds go by. J.J. is seen on camera encouraging Tully Blanchard. And then we hear his voice. Joining the announcers, the calmest man, curious, but calm most calm man you've ever seen on a pro wrestling show. He asks, I wrote every word down. Why are your cameras following me around? Did you think that I was going to kick Dave Spearman or something when he was on the floor with my feet? If I need to kick Dave Spearman in order to garner a victory for Tully Blanchard on television, then Mr. Blanchard does not deserve to be a world tag team champion. And believe me, he deserves to be a champion. (laughs) Yes. Is he in the Hall of Awesome? <laughs> yeah. Okay, just making sure. Maybe multiple times. You may have to put him back in. Yeah. He's the best. He's awesome. So Dave Spearman is a big, thick dude, and Tully gave him a lot more than you expect for your typical Saturday afternoon squash, and eventually pinned him with a slingshot suplex. An excellent little battle. This is fun. So is Lex Luger's outfit. Not as good as Flair's outfit later. That's true. Lex comes out in a pink-striped like T-shirt, and acid-washed black denim parachute pants. Yeah. This is fucking awesome. It's the 80s, dude. It, it sure was. Luger. There were more 80s than right here. Yeah. He admitted that Barry looked good, but said, I have been there. The limos, the jets, the women, the fancy hotels. It's all a facade. Says the horsemen, they, they claim they don't care what the fans think. And everyone knows that you're not supposed to cheer for the horsemen. But people do because they have all the gold. But it, uh, the, uh, here's the truth. And they're all trash. And in the Omni, Brian. Barry won't be able Fucking to stand in that apron all night. I'm sick of the Omni. Eventually, they'll have to step through the ropes. And uh, as he said, we, they would have their hands raised in the air. I assume that means they were going to win. Yeah. yeah. Hands raised. Kevin Sullivan and Rick Steiner versus Rick Paradise and Rick Allen. That's a lot of fucking Ricks. This is too many Ricks you in couldn't one find, match. You couldn't rename those two jobbers? Kind of a Richard and Ricky. So, first off, it's Kevin Sullivan and Rick Steiner, and Sullivan is just gigantic. Mm-hmm. And Rick Steiner's gigantic. It's fucking monstrous. And they beat the shit out of these guys. You watch Rick Steiner here, and you, there, there, there's the rumors, I don't know if they were confirmed, but like Steiner's in line to be world champion. 
And you watch them here and you think, yeah, why not? Yeah. He... They just beat the shit out of these guys. He sure did. I'm enjoying myself. I'm like, man, what a great squash. Then they say, we'll be right back. Yes. And I thought, they beat the shit out of him through a commercial break. <laughs> he sure did. They come back, they beat the shit out of him more, and then they won. This this made the show worthwhile. <laughs> this was tremendous. These guys beating the hell out of these nerds. My, <laughs> my favorite part of this. They're working over Rick Allen. They're stomping and clubbering him. And... Rick Paradise, Rick, by the way. Rick Paradise. Can you imagine? Like, if you're new in the business, I guess it's different nowadays because everyone's so nice. But, like, fucking Rick Paradise or, like, John Strong or all these other goofy names you saw these jobbers Dark have. Dark Star. It's like, fuck. These guys walked into the locker room and it's like, what's your name? Rick Paradise? Okay, you're going to be in with Sullivan and Rick Steiner. That's the end of that. Teach that fucking guy a lesson. <laughs> so they're beating up Rick Allen. And finally, Rick Paradise can't take no more. And he, he comes blazing into the ring without a tag like a hero. And he clubbers Sullivan from behind. And Sullivan doesn't pause, doesn't blink. He's not surprised. He's not caught off guard. He just turns and starts wailing on this motherfucker. Yep. <laughs> it was great. I love this match. Eventually, Sullivan won with a foot stomp. Oh, Flair comes out. He's got this... Red jacket. A double-breasted maroon jacket. It's just red. Okay. There's no maroon about this, okay. Vinny. It's blood red. Okay. He's got a yellow checkered tie to go with his red jacket. <laughs> I'm looking at him, and it's like, you know, if you're going to wear a suit places, and you want to buy a really nice suit, right? Mm -hmm. It's buy a really damn nice black suit, navy blue. Sure. Get a couple of different shirts. Like... Go this place, wear your nice suit. Go this place, wear your nice suit. Ric Flair is a television star, okay? <laughs> and I can only imagine how much he spent on this fucking suit. <laughs> a lot. Not cheap. No. And it's such a fucking ridiculous suit that you know that he's not going to wear it regularly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. He's probably going to wear it one time. I don't ever remember him in a red red suit. I don't recall this. No. He probably spent, like, over $1,000 on this one suit so he could do this one promo. In 1988 money. And never wear this fucking suit again. He could have gotten a car for what he spent on this suit to wear one time. So we got to this promo. I got to talk about the promo for a second here. All right. There, I don't watch sports. No. I don't know if you're aware of any. Oh, I am. Okay. I don't know anything about sports. But I know famous names in sports, okay? Sure. I love when Ric Flair's cutting a promo... And he's building up ahead of steam. He's building up ahead of steam here on Dr. Death Steve Williams. They're facing off of the Omni. Right. Uh, the Omni, you say? The Omni tomorrow. Right. I can't watch it. No. Oh, okay. wait. So they're facing off of the Omni tomorrow, and he's, he's ranting and raving. And all of a sudden he says, Dr. Death Steve Williams, tomorrow night you're going to be a loser. You're going to be a loser like Larry Bird. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. He goes, you and Larry Bird, you'll both be losers on Friday or whatever. I was like, what the fuck? Well, I... He's such a passionate fan. <laughs> I, know, I know more about sports than you, two, than you do. I was still baffled. Well, he's a big sports fan. Yes. And, like, it dominates his mind. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter if he's cutting a promo on Dr. Death Steve Williams. If he, feels, if he feels passionately about a game that's coming up Sunday... He's going to mention that Larry Bird is going to be a loser because he hates that fucking guy, just like Dr. Death Steve Williams. I had to look it up because Larry Bird is famous, and you don't get famous in sports by losing a lot, typically, very rarely. So at this exact time, as the this promo was in the midst of a playoff series between Larry Bird's Boston Celtics and the Atlanta Hawks. So maybe that's why he was sucking up. Yeah, the, the Hawks. Who play in Atlanta. Yes. In the Omni, in fact. Yes. So maybe it was a suck-up to them. I'm sure it was. And the uh, Celtics won. They defeated the Hawks. He's not a loser, but they were a loser in the next round. They lost to Or, Or it could be, Vinny, that he just hates Larry Bird. I mean, that's And the possible. Boston Celtics. Because for some reason, again, I don't know a lot about sports, but like I know people who passionately hate a certain team for some reason. Sure. Maybe they grew up somewhere and their team was always beaten by this other team mm -hmm. or yeah. whatever. Maybe Flair just really doesn't like these goddamn Boston Celtics. That would also be possible, except I could have sworn that in years past, he's actually done promos about being a huge Larry Bird fan. Mm. So I think, I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> Here's the other answer. It's Ric Flair. He's crazy. He, he's out of his goddamn mind. Well, there's that too, yeah. yeah. 
Nikita Koloff beat Bob Riddle with a sickle in a minute. Yeah. Okay. At this point, we get to the greatest thing I've ever seen on a WCW Saturday Night Show. New Hall of Famer Gary Hart. The new Hall of Awesome or new Hall of Famer Gary Hart. He cut the best fucking promo. I watched it three times in a row. I wrote down every word. If you'd like to me to repeat this. We got, do we have the time? Uh, well, I wrote down the important word at the end. <laughs> can, I, can I read the conclusion well, and then you can read the rest? Why don't you go to the free conclusion? <laughs> he concludes that tomorrow night in the Omni, mm-hmm. he does not want any, quote, right-wing liberal honkies chanting, go Nikita, go. That don't fly in Atlanta. We don't like that in Atlanta, he says. Okay. Yeah. Right-wing liberal honkies is how he closed his uh, promo here. A line you will not hear on any show or, frankly, anywhere else in 2018. So Gary Hart begins. He's very calm. He's like J.J. Dillon, Dillon earlier. He doesn't raise his voice. He speaks. He enunciates. He makes his point. But he doesn't yell and scream like a madman. Brought many guys, many wrestlers to the Omni in Atlanta. They have seen a lot of great wrestlers stand by the side of Gary Hart. But I can say, David, without a question of a doubt, there has never been anyone finer, more prepared to beat Nikita than none other than Al Perez. And I'd also like to talk, like to, talk to the ladies of the audience. You know, tomorrow night there's special ticket prices, so there ain't no reason that you can't come to the Omni if you really want to be there. Now, if you want to look and see what a real fine-looking man is like, I'm putting up the Latin heartthrob Al Perez face-to-face against the ugliest man in professional wrestling by the name of Nikita. Not only is he going to be uglier when Perez gets through with him in the Omni, what we're, what we're going to do to you, Nikita, we're going to leave you out. The heartthrob is going to put the spinning toe hold on you, and we are going to see if we can make you scream loud enough that the people in Moscow can hear you. I know up there in the five other seats, they're going to hear him. And remember when I tell you that this is the best thing that's ever happened to the National Wrestling Alliance in many years. I'm a man that knows what I'm talking about. Nikita, you get it ready. You bring it on to the Omni, and we're going to find out about 22, 23 minutes into the match when your tongue is hanging out and the heartthrob is all over top of you. He can look up there to the $5 seats and throw some kisses to the women. Because you know, not only can he wrestle, he sure is pretty, isn't he? Handsome man. I watched this three times in a row, over and over and over. Isn't it amazing that, like, the week that he goes into the Hall of Fame, he cuts, like, the Hall of Fame promo? This is why. This promo right here is why. He is incredible. He's the best. He was. He is the best. Yeah. He's not among the best. He's not like the best. He is the best this week. Larry Zabisco, who is still, for some reason, the Western States Heritage Champion. Because who the fuck cares? Uh, okay. You think that's high in like their booking priority? I'm surprised. What should we do with the Western States Heritage? Who could feud with Larry Zabisco? No, but more, no. Who cares? That that that. My point is, who cares? I'm yes. surprised Larry hasn't left this in an airport lobby somewhere. <laughs> Maybe he has. Maybe it's a tag. And belt they keep he's returning it. around. Yeah. He's yeah. wrestling Dark Star. Larry, you left this here. Nobody wants it. <laughs> Please come reclaim your Western States Heritage Championship TV belt. <laughs> Jim Ross utters the following disclaimer. Gary Hart's political views don't necessarily reflect those of the National Wrestling Alliance. The National Wrestling Alliance says right-wing liberal honkies can chant whatever they want. Yes. Larry looked awesome in the squatch, and he won with a rolling neckbreaker. Jim Cornette cuts a promo. You'll never guess what he cut a promo about. Was it in the Omni? The fucking Omni. I was so sick of the Omni. <laughs> well, good news. This is the end of the show. He comes out and... David Crockett has some shot, uh, some crack at him for getting his face thrown in cake. And Cornette says, I had my face buried in cake for 15 seconds. You've had yours buried in ugly for 35 years. <laughs> so he goes off with the Fantastics. They are on top of the world. They've got the U.S. titles. The only thing they got, they got left is to get a hold of me and whip me. But of course that's not going to happen. There's a 10 lashes to the loser match in the Omni. He's not involved. He should not have to take any lashes. One way or another, he was not getting whipped in front of all those people. Although, he, he, before saying this, he made it very, very clear. If the Midnight Express loses, Stan will get 10 lashes, Bobby will get 10 lashes, and then Jim Cornette will get his 10 lashes. Oh, man. But that's not going to happen, he promises. Now I want to go to the Omni. Oh, I can't. So he's, he's ranting and ranting, and they just go off the show. He's still going, running his mouth. Yep. I thought the show was great. That's pretty damn good, but it's nothing, nothing, I don't know. There's just something about it. It was pointless 
If you're not going to the Omni. Yeah, or you can't even see the Omni is my point, Vinny. Like, we watch shows all the time that build up pay-per-views. At least, like, if sure. I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Like, if I really thought, God damn, I got to see this Al Perez match gets Nikita Koloff. Yeah. Like, I'd go on the network and watch it. I can't do that for this one. No. It's, it's in the ether somewhere. Yeah. So then. Unfortunately, all this <laughs> warrior stuff is accessible. It's easily found. I prefer I prefer if all of these matches had been at the Omni the next day. With the click of a button, you can have this, these matches thrust upon you whether you want them or not. So let's get fucking like a monkey. Excellent timing, Vinny. You get better every week. I see now you put pressure on me. Yeah, you fuck it up next week. I'm sure I will. I'm Rob read him next week. <laughs> that actually is a great idea. <laughs> NWA NW- World Championship Wrestling. May 28th, 1988. <laughs> so the show opens. This is actually explained later. But what we see right here is Barry Windham's cutting a promo. He's ranting about how he's been held back in Dusty Rhodes' shadow. Now he has found real friends in the Four Horsemen. And Dusty Rhodes comes out to confront him. And Dusty is shouting at him, "How I dare you to look me in the eye and call yourself a man. And then J.J. turns to Dusty and tries to intervene. And Dusty turns to J.J. and throws this punch, and J.J. Dillon goes down, and Barry just turns and watches like it's in slow motion. Now, when they do the full context later, it makes some sense. Here, he just looked like the guy with the worst reflexes in the world. So we get a Kevin Sullivan promo. Now, for the first three weeks ago this happened, (laughs) they finally interview him. Hey, (laughs) you kidnapped Patty three weeks ago. What's up? For the first 30 seconds of this, I thought I had screwed up. And we were watching an old show because it's the same old thing. I always tell the truth. You can ask Patty about if I'm telling them the truth. I'm going to build a Tower of Doom. And I was very, very confused. And then suddenly <laughs> it became new and he took a right turn and he lost his mind. Yes. This is, by the way, the 80s Tower of Doom and not the Doomsday Cage Match. Yes. He it's says, a different Tower of Doom. He's talking about where he got the idea for the Tower of Doom. Yes. He explains that he has been to Singapore. He has laid with the lady with one eye. He went to some valley or something. I couldn't write it all down. But the he valley adds, of the lepers, I believe. The lepers, yes. The valley of the lepers. And he ate the monkey brains. Yes. And as a result of all this, he has been inspired to build the triple cage. He says this triple cage, one on top of the other, you got to fight your way down. It's only been done twice before. And I thought he was going to say... <laughs> Love is too... I thought it was going to be in world class. For he says, no, it was done for the Great American Bash, which is not true. It was not on the Great American Bash before. The second one, I can't verify if it's not true. I wasn't there, but he explains it was built 2,200 years ago in China. Yeah. <laughs> then he goes even more insane and starts talking about stomping rats to death. Yeah. He's a nut. I loved when he talked about the original Tower of Doom being created in China 2,200 years ago, and this woman in the crowd starts howling with laughter. (laughs) What's this crazy guy talking about? Singapore, China, fucking rats. And And this match is so bad. (laughs) Well, we'll get to the match. He loses his mind, and then David Crockett says, Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Sullivan. (laughs) What else are you going to say? I don't know. What else do you say to a guy talking about laying with a lady with one eye and building a cage 2,200 years ago in China? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what he said. Yeah, because this was on the Great American Bash, the Price for Freedom uh, video cassette that I bought, and this match is so horrendously <laughs> bad. I couldn't follow it at all. It's like, what the hell is going on? Uh, so bad. I can't wait. <laughs> the Fantastics versus Joe Cruz and Larry Stevens. Yeah. So Joe Cruz is very big, he's very shitty, stiff and unathletic and clumsy and everything. The announcers are plugging the Fantastics match coming up against the Sheep Herders. They had a long, that sounds awesome. long rivalry with, uh, I, th- I think, in the UWF. They're talking about the history in the Crockett Cup and stuff. So the Fantastics win with a rocket launcher, and then this gets great. Before we get to that, I just want to talk about the fans. They hit the rocket launcher, and actually before that, they're just doing their comeback or whatever. I guess they didn't have a comeback. They won the whole time. But they have these women in the crowd, and these women are on their feet, and they're pumping their fists, and they're so happy to see these handsome young baby faces out-wrestling their opponents to victory. I 
just thought, what has happened to this business? What has happened to this business? They were just they were just so happy to be there. I was having fun. And seeing them win and be victorious and be so handsome. Now it's just like they're depressed, belittled by the owners, made fools of on a regular basis. Just sad. So the Fantastics cut in this promo. And they talk about how they've driven Cornette crazy. They, they, they showed up and beat the Midnight Express. They stole the U.S. tag titles. And Jim Cornette's losing his mind. We got to put him in a straitjacket. And that just melted my heart because all they're doing, they just keep the feud going. And every month or so, they add a new stip. So it was 10 lashes to the loser. And they went around the loop doing the 10 lashes match. Well, they've done that now. What can we do? Straight jacket match. If we win, Jim Cornette has to wear a straight jacket. So they're building to that now. So, of course, Cornette has to come out. He interrupts from a safe distance. He's welding his tennis racket in case these men attack him, although he's insulting them left and right, calling them geeks repeatedly. Says they're jealous of him. The NWA is jealous of him. The Crockett's are jealous of him. He and the Minute Express are the only reason anyone watched this show. We're, we're gone, we're quitting, and soon Ted Turner will air, will air Mighty Mouse cartoons in this time slot. Side note, Brian, we should review Mighty Mouse cartoons for Pope Reese. Hey, why not? Yeah. So, Cornette storms off, and Roger says, hey, if he leaves, is the best thing to happen in this promotion. Yep. He says the Fantastics keep backing him into the corner. They're putting him on scaffolds. They're trying to get his neck broke. The only reason people watch this show is because of him. I think this may have been the greatest Jim Cornette promo I've ever seen. It was awesome. I thought he was so unbelievably great here. Out of his mind. He's out of his mind insisting he's not crazy. Yes. yes. That word straight jacket triggered him. It did. He's gotten to. So the air of the entirety of that Barry Windham Dusty Rhodes confrontation. And I mentioned how it makes more sense in context. So Barry was surprised to see Dusty. And when Dusty laid out J.J., what actually happened was, when you watch the whole thing, it's clear, Barry is conflicted. He doesn't quite know what to do. And uh, Dusty briefly challenges him, but then Tully and Arn hit the ring, they grab Dusty, and now that Dusty is helpless, now Barry's mind is made up. And he lays that iron claw on Dusty Rhodes until Dusty Rhodes bleeds. Oh. From the claw. Yes. And Lex makes the save, but Dusty's down. This leads to a Dusty Rhodes promo in the studio. Says he's the teacher, he's the coach. He knows Barry better than better better than anyone. He's gonna pay Wyndham back in scorn. He's plugging double bull rope matches and barbed wire matches. He's running down Wyndham. He's running down all the horsemen. They're all gonna pay in scorn. And the whole time the crowd is chanting Barry, Barry. Oh, the ship is sinking. So we're at the end of May of, of 88, and strong rumors that the company is being sold to Turner. Probably a few weeks away. I forget the exact date that it gets sold, but there's top guys not getting paid, guys wanting to leave. It's a disaster at this point, and the fans are chanting for Barry. In a random trios match, I'll say, <laughs> Sting and Steve Williams and Nikita Koloff Versus Ryan Wagner and Gary Phelps and Dave Spearman and maybe also Dale Laparus. This was so amazing. Okay, first off, every time Sting has a match or Nikita, it's like two seconds. So they bring out Sting, Nikita, and Dr. Death, who also has like 10 second matches, against three geeks. And I'm like, it's going to be just like Raw. The ring entrances are going to be longer than the match. Then they decide they're going to put in time. Yeah. So we both wrote the names down. Ryan Wagner, Gary Phelps, and Dave Spearman. They have graphics. Yeah, they have graphics. All of a sudden, all the announcers start referring to Dale Laparus. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking not in the graphic. No. Now, we've seen him before. This was definitely Dale Laparus. <laughs> There's no mistaking Dale Laparus for any other human. Okay. Maybe Ichabod Crane. Let's talk the positives and negatives of Dale Laparus. And yes, I actually have a positive, Vinny. I see that look on your face. First off, I'm 90% sure he's dead. I'm pretty sure he's a dead body that's been reanimated. Okay. okay. Except if you've ever watched, Jesus like, Christ. the original Frankenstein, 
<laughs> it's not where I thought you were going. <laughs> the er- Usually, Brian, I know what you're when saying. we talk about wrestlers being dead, it's a bad thing. I think he was dead in this match, okay? Okay. Reanimated. Still more mobile than the actual Frankenstein. Or the f- actual Frankenstein might have been more mobile. But the point is, I will give him credit for one thing, Vinny. And Lance, you can back me up on this. This fucking guy, everything he did looked terrible, okay? <laughs> but he was always in the right spot to look terrible. Oh, my God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. What's, how, the, what's the world record for greatest backhanded listen, compliment? How many of these fucking morons have we seen? <laughs> that they're, in the, they're out of place for every single spot. You know what I mean? I would so much rather be in the ring with a guy that was fucking terrible... But he was always where he was supposed to be. Then a guy who looks good doing shit, but he's always out of position. Right, Lance? Am I wrong about this? <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know if we can praise him for being exactly where he needed to be to make everything look like shit. <laughs> well, I mean, he looked like shit. But, I mean, he was there for the power slam. He was there for this. He was there for that. He was terrible. I don't even know how he got there. <laughs> he, like, teleported into the match or something. It was amazing. There may have been four men there, for all I know. I used to love matches like this. It's like three guys I like, and they just kick people's asses. Yeah, it was great. And I I thought when they were done, I said, okay, clearly they're going to face like the powers of pain and Ivan Koloff, or they're going to face three of the horsemen or something. No. They just did this match, and they were done. (laughs) The the, the unit broke up after that. Uh, One one thing that I was reminded of in this match, because I was always a big Nikita Koloff fan, the one thing he'd always do is like when he went to cock the sickle, he'd turn his wrist. So that his bone and his the forearm bony part would be forcing towards the guy when he threw it, where most people would, you know, the palm of your hand is sort of forward, you'd hit it with the meaty part. Nikita would always cock his wrist so that you get the wrist bone on his clothesline. I always thought that was cool. Yeah, you know what that is called? It's called the blade. I'm hitting the blade right now. You know what I'm saying, Vinny? I do. The blade. I'm with you. Not the flat, fatty part here. The blade. I gotcha. I follow. Yeah, we have good been, eye, Lance. Good eye. We have been talking about how Nikita's been smaller since he came back, and boy, if you had any doubt of that, when he's in the ring with, especially Doctor Death, but even Sting's bigger too. He's it's, playing the role of John Cena with his new haircut too. It's horrible. See, have you ever wondered what would have happened of his career if his wife didn't get ill and he take that t- took that time off? I don't know. It's hard to say. I for for years with no evidence other than that it made sense for, and I mean years. I was convinced that King Kong Bundy was Plan B for the main event of WrestleMania two, and they were trying to get Nikita just because it made more sense than um, Hogan had already fought Bundy a bunch of times by then. And you know Nikita has said that they tried to to sign him and he turned him down. He was happy with where he was. I you know that's that's Nikita saying that. I don't know if anyone's ever verified it, but. That's my thought, is how, how different would it be if he had jumped and it had been Hogan, Hulk Hogan versus Nikita Koloff at Mania 2? It's hard to say because they just brought in heels to just feud with him and then it, lose and move on. It may have been a short thing. Yeah, it may have, been, may have been slightly better than Bundy. Yeah. Who knows? He had Gary Hart and Al Perez coming out for a promo. God, Gary is so awesome. <laughs> and like, when he first showed up, we've talked about this before, he was like, okay. You know what I mean? He just kind of did promos, and they were all right. But he's on there with Cornette and J.J. Dillon. Now he's like the best guy. Maybe second only. Well, on this show, he was second. To Cornette. But like on most shows, I think he's better than Cornette. Last show, he put Cornette away. Yeah, and uh, J.J. Dillon is in a class of his own, I think. But fuck, Gary's good. And they're all different. Yes! (laughs) Yes! He comes out here. He says, Nikita will be running out of gas in 15 minutes. He's a personal public challenge for the Great American Bash. And the challenge is any type of match you want. He says, I'll tie an arm behind Alperez's back. I'll handcuff myself to the top rope and I'll take a nap while he beats you. It used to be something special, Nikita, when you were beating up jabronis. But Al is like Ricky Flair. Yes, Ricky Flair. A 60-minute man. And as for Sting, he says, and I'm thinking, okay, he's going to set up the Alperez Sting program for when he's done with Nikita. As for Sting, if Sting don't like it, he can come talk to me. And I, with what I carry in my pocket, I'll take care of Sting. Did he just threaten to shoot Sting? I think you either shoot him or stab him. <laughs> so they're about ready to go. And Crockett asks one more question. 
about Al. I didn't catch the question. But Gary's response is, you know he is, David. You're a very astute man. Who are you kidding? And they leave. You guys read the Gary Hart bio in The Observer? Either of you? Oh, sorry, I thought that was a question. No. G. Raff, did you? No? Okay. Well, anyway, he talks about how Gary Hart grew up in a very bad part of Chicago and ended up getting involved with the mob. Mm. And, like, his character is basically like a guy in the mob. And he talked about how he would sometimes be there when the mob boss would explain to somebody what was going to happen if you didn't get that money paid. And he noted that mob boss never raised his voice. Mm-hmm. He calmly explained, we're going to break both your legs, chop off your arms, cut your dick off, put you in the cement boots, and throw you off the... Never raised his voice or anything. And that's what, that's, that's what Gary did. He rarely raised his voice. He okay, just... I've got a question for you both. Then. Yes. While Gary Hart was cutting this great promo, did Al Perez bring more life than g Raff is bringing at this moment? <laughs> G. Raff is so much more charismatic right now. It's amazing. At this exact moment. Yeah. Yes. Al, Al, Al Perez, uh, I, he's a, as, as Gary noted last week, he's a handsome man. He's a handsome he's man. He's a great physique, a he's, great head of hair, a, a nice he's a, smile. He's a Latin. And if you Just t- like myself. If you took a picture of Aladdin? Latin. Oh, Latin. You jackass. <laughs> if you took a picture of him. And put it in a magazine would look great. And in real life, he looks just like that picture from the magazine. There's no personality behind this man. Yeah, it's amazing because I watched his match and he's throwing these fucking Germans. He's a talented athlete. He faced Bob Riddle, and it's like he has a gr- he has a great look. He has a great physique. Like he doesn't look like he's a huge juiced up dude. He looks no. like an athlete. He's bodybuilder. He looks and an like athlete. Seth Rollins. Yeah, looks like a CrossFit guy. He's in there, and he just he has a good match, and he works great, and he's just v- devoid of charisma. If he would have just had a little bit of charisma, like this much, <laughs> if he had the charisma of G-Raph, he'd have been like a world champion. I can say for sure G-Raph is much more colorful than Al Perez. He's much more colorful. Yeah. So Al wins the spinning toe hold. And I love this in the replay. I think we may have talked about this last week, but they always show Al Perez's flying forearm that he uses as a setup. This forearm is, I don't want to say it looks horrible. It's not like it's embarrassingly bad or anything, but there's 20,000 guys who do a better flying forearm than Al Perez. It's the worst thing he does. And they always show it in the replay and talk about how devastating it is. Flair comes out for a promo. <laughs> First of all, they cut to a woman in the crowd who's... She's not a she's not a Ric Flair admirer admirer, nor is she dressed up like him to mock him. She's dressed up like the female version of Ric Flair. She doesn't have a suit on. She has like a fancy gown, but also the sunglasses and the platinum blonde hair. And An Ultimate Warriors. Warriors haircut. She may have had Ultimate Warriors haircut. That's yeah. possible. So he starts, talk, he starts talking about Lex. Lex was blessed by God with that great body, but he's light years away from being where I've been my whole career. And he says, I want to be like Sting. I want to wake up and paint my face all over. <laughs> I want to come to the ring and beat my chest. And go, woo! And go, woo! I was like, you do that. <laughs> he says, no, I don't want to do that. I want to show myself as a businessman. I want to show high class. He talks about his suit and whatever. He's, he says he's on the same side as the four horsemen and the varsity club and the powers of pain. And when they bring out those cages, they bring out those towers. When they bring out the bull ropes, I'm betting on the bad guys. It's so awesome. He put over the entire roster, essentially. Yep. You and David point. Crockett is always so happy to be in the presence of the great Ric Flair. Wouldn't you? Well, yeah, but he's supposed to be like, Unbiased. He's supposed, to be, an impartial. He's supposed to be the owner of the fucking company's that's, brother. Oh yeah, that that's fair. He does. He should be an impartial observer. Uh, Nikita came out for a promo. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to just tell you the words that I heard here. Okay, <laughs> I heard break leg, hole in my neck, cement, Gary Hart, <laughs> end of the career of Nikita Koloff, goofball Arn Anderson. You ask Ric Flair. And you find out I'm going to be here long, long time. Did I miss anything? I tried really hard. Nothing of note. I, I, I wrote down different words, but it, every bit is incomprehensible. Okay. So, 
the key here is as he's cutting the, the the podium is ten feet from the ring. Yeah. And so when he mentions that goofball Arn Anderson, he's pointing at Arn Anderson in the ring. So this gets Arn's dander up. So Arn's out there to wrestle Keith Steinborn. He patiently waits for his camera time until Nikita's done. The bell rings. Arn Anderson murders uh, Keith Steinborn and pins him with a DDT in 15 seconds. That was awesome. Then we have a horseman promo. Barry's plugging the double bull rope match, which I'm not even sure he's in, honestly. Uh, says he's gonna, it's his turn to teach Dusty a lesson, horseman style. Warns Lex to stay out of his face. Tully plugs the upcoming title defense against... It, it's at the Clash of Champions uh, in Miami. It's Dusty Rhodes and Sting versus himself and, Ar- and uh, Arn Anderson. It's in Miami where Dusty Rhodes thrives, where he's beaten so many people, won a world title in Miami. He's going to try to regain some of that lost glory. And then I <laughs> don't really know what Arn was talking about. He goes off about a civil war. There are men turning on their fathers and their brothers. Titles will switch and switch again. And I may get sick of the four horsemen, but I'm going to put all that aside, and we'll be a unit. Hmm. They all did the horseman handshake. It's odd. That was a weird promo. Oh, boy. Oh, the mighty Wilbur <laughs> is heading to the ring, <laughs> and he's sidetracked. <laughs> he just... David says, Wilbur, can you come here a moment? How are you feeling? Wilbur says, well, I feel 100%. My leg is all better. Well, am I supposed to be looking over here? I can't believe I'm teaming with a former world champion. I want to thank all my friends in Hayward, California. Hayward, California? That's where he's from. All pro wrestling? I guess. This is the best baby face ever. How many times have we mentioned that? He's fantastic. He's the greatest baby face ever. He's, he's so humbled to be teaming with a former world champion. Mm-hmm. And... He can't, he cannot believe we're soon going to be the world tag team champions. He can't even fathom it. A country boy like him as the world tag team champion, inconceivable. Just a hardworking fella from Hayward, California. Just a hardworking big guy. So happy to have all his friends in Hayward and all over the world. Just, you've never seen a guy, this is what Mighty Wilbur is. You've never seen a guy so happy to be there. Oh yeah. That's the key. Just happy to be. He's here. blessed. When, when when he says, "I owe all the glory to God," I don't laugh like I do at John Jones. <laughs> no. Yes, Rob. So, sorry, I was just going to say that's how I feel every time when I walk in here. Oh, blessed. thank you. Yes, exactly. You're like my David Crockett. Thank I appreciate you. it. Anytime. And I muted him. <laughs> sorry. So this leads to an an amazing match. A, a fitting main was event ever. to this show. Can we talk about Dan Grandy? We, we're talking about all four of these dudes. He was an atrocity. <laughs> Ronnie, Ronnie Garvin and Mighty Wilbur versus, I believe that in their debuts, Robbie Ullman. You don't say. And Dan Grandy. <laughs> Fuck. So you immediately, I think you just screamed atrocity as soon as Dan Grandy appeared on the screen. <laughs> so here's my here, here's my description of Dan Grandy. You ever... Take a, either a videotape or a photocopy, and you make a copy of that, and then a copy of that, and a copy of that. And with each copy, the quality goes down farther and farther and farther and farther. Dan Grandy is a copy of 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 Dr. Death Steve Williams. <laughs> you could look at it that way. He's tall. He's got the same haircut. He even has some facial resemblance. No body whatsoever. And he's just fucking horrible. He's a Dr. Death shrinky dink. <laughs> kind of. He's a... Except it's not a... It, uh, I don't know. He's a Dr. Death shrinky dink that put back, got put back in the sun. It's all melted and warped now. Yes. So, he's in there with the mighty Wilbur. They're doing some bad, bad, bad wrestling. And then they both tag out... And Robbie Allman comes in with Ronnie Garvin. And maybe it's because he watched all that bad wrestling. I don't know. But Ronnie Garvin, who never takes it easy with guys in the first place. No, he doesn't. He's in an epically bad mood. Fuck, can you imagine? At one point, I am pretty sure he chopped Allman onto his head. <laughs> which I did not think was possible. So he takes him down. He's just torturing him. This isn't... 
grappling. He's not using holds or technique. He's just grabbing body parts and yanking on them. Yeah. Steps on his head, pulls his ankles, pulls pulls his his neck. Yeah. Just reaches down on his midsection, just grabs a bunch of flesh and pulls. Yeah, this is brutal. (laughs) Just tortures him. The old catch guys were like, fuck, stay away from him. He had both arms chicken winged with his one leg while standing on the dude's head. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, fuck, there was a one-arm Kimura on UFC last night. <laughs> oh, yeah, how about that? Rob's baffled. He can't figure this out. Yeah. So, was, yes, Lance. I'm assuming Garvin always gets the first-time jobbers because nobody wants to go in at him a second time. I don't know. Dude. I, I've noticed the same thing with Sullivan. I've had the same thought. Like, like Sullivan's the, the, the initiation. Yeah, he's, he, he's he the... He hazes uh, you. He That's, sure fucking does. And Garvin's in the same category. Maybe even more extreme, actually. This was every angry big brother... With a helpless little brother just torturing him for fun in the basement for a while. You know what I love about Garvin? We mentioned this before. He has no wrestling background. Yeah. Like, he wasn't like an amateur or anything like that. He only did professional wrestling. But you watch him in there and you're like, this guy's a fucking shooter. He'd tie you in a knot and kill you. He's just doing wrestling. He's just a, he's just a wrestler. Mm-hmm. So the finish is he tags Wilbur in. He lays Allman out. Wilbur hits the ropes, and he runs, and he jumps, I'm going to say, one and a half inches into the air, and he comes down with a splash and pins this man. This was something else. That's awesome. What a main event. It was a true main event. Wilbur does a lot of shows on the road, but he's rarely on TV. Yeah. Should tell you something, I guess. They'll put anybody on the show. <laughs> and finally, we have a Lex Luger promo. This was great because it was so simple. Yeah. First, he notes... I see the four horsemen spent their money to fly their 12 fans out here. And that's why all these so-called good guys are getting booed all day. And then he just ran it. He had like 10 more seconds. Tore his shirt off. Talked about how strong he was. And he's going to beat up Ric Flair and Barry Wood. No, the whole key is. So they're going to have a match, I think, in Baltimore for the title in like July. So they're building up Flair versus Luger as this big world championship match. Everyone's expecting the title change. And Luger's whole promo was... I don't need a $1,000 suit to come out here and look good. I could be wearing a suit. I could be wearing a burlap bag. I look great. He tears his shirt off. Everybody cheers. Show goes off the air. Perfect. That was perfect. Muscle Man versus Ric Flair. That's the story. Let's keep it simple. I love this show, and it was only 40 minutes long. Excellent stuff. A lot of fun. Yeah. Lance, do you think you'll check this show out more in in the future? Uh, I, I, if I have time, I will, because I do enjoy it. I watched this back in the day, so I love this kind of stuff. It's the best stuff out there. It's excellent. Actually, maybe with the one less hour of Nitro each week, I'll be able to. Hey, that's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. 